Test. Good morning, everyone. I just want you to know we'll be starting in a minute. Sorry we're a little bit late. Thanks for coming. Well, good day, Mr. and Ms. GSA from border to border and coast to coast and all the ships at sea. Welcome to this GSA reverse industry training spectacular. You're welcome. You're welcome. We are so honored and pleased to have you join us today. And not just those of you in this august chamber in the headquarters of the Washington, D.C. Office of the U.S. General Services Administration, but we are broadcast worldwide on GSA's YouTube channel. Again, hooray. Thank you. Thank you. Now, normally, when we've been broadcasting through GSA system, I'll make some crack about it being 9 o'clock here and 6 o'clock in California, 3 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning in Hawaii. But we're worldwide. It could be the crack of dawn wherever you are, and it could be time for bed wherever you are. But again, we are so honored and pleased that you are here with us. And a special note, if I may, to our virtual viewers, and that is I kind of like to crash the system right now. I would love to know where in the world you are watching this event. Now, I do not want a response saying, I'm in my hot tub at Disney World on vacation, Ed. You know I'm talking to you, Ed, so I don't want to hear from my friend Ed, but anybody else. Now, granted, you're going to be on your honor system. If you tell me you're, you're at the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station, I might not believe you unless you've got photographic evidence. But we would love to find out where you are if you could email us at reverseindustrytraining at gsa.gov. We would love to hear from you because the person or persons geographically the furthest from Washington, D.C. could win cash and fabulous prizes. No, you're not getting any cash, and the only prize really is bragging rights for being the furthest from Washington, D.C. But again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we know that this event is competing with the World Cup competition, the matches between Senegal and Colombia and Japan and Poland. When we started doing reverse industry training, at least the Olympics in Pyongyang had the decency not to schedule anything during our reverse industry training event. But you know the World Cup, hey, we're just the World Cup. But remember, 
The World Cup comes around every four years. We are unique. This is the only thing that's going on right now. So where else would you rather be? Uh, so to move us along, though, in our program, I would like to introduce, if I may, the intrepid producer of these proceedings, and that is GSA's procurement ombudsman, Melissa Gary. Melissa, would you please join us? Thank you, John, for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. You have no idea of how much we appreciate you. I also want to give a special shout out to my team, uh, Henry, Teresa, um, Tracy, and Liz is running around somewhere too. Um, also, I'd like to offer a special thanks to Betsy Steele, Jay Huey, um, Dan, um, Dan, let me make sure I get your name right. You told me yesterday. Radonis, <laughs> and also to Dan Huey, I'm sorry, Dan um, Tui, Tui, who couldn't be with us today because he's feeling a little under the weather, but I think he's listening. Yay, Dan. Um, and, and last but certainly not least, our industry partners. Without you guys, we wouldn't be here today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And we have something very special for you today. I think you're going to get a whole lot out of it. And we plan to circle around and do a deeper dive at a future writ. So we're going to ask for your feedback uh, via a survey after the um, session is over. The survey should um, be sent out around 3 o'clock. So keep an eye out for that. Also, for those of you who are viewing the event, um, there is a website for you to submit your questions. And that is GSA Reverse Industry Training .gov. So submit any questions you, that you have to that website. We'll get them, and the moderator will read them. So, I, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. No GSA. Reverse Industry .gov. Okay, Reverse Industry Training .gov. Thank you, Betsy, for keeping me <laughs> correct. But again, thank you all, and enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Melissa. Really do appreciate that. Now, today's session, as you are all quite aware, is built around cloud technologies and all that they entail. So it is good, right, and appropriate that we hear from the Deputy Commissioner of the Federal Acquisition Service and Director of the Technology Transformation Service in the U.S. General <laughs> Services Administration, Joanne Collins-Smee. not going to be nearly as entertaining as John, however. So um, again, I'm thrilled to be here today with you all. And we have about 900 people that are here between in person and online. So that's really great stuff. Um, and I want to thank the team that pulled this together. Our ombudsman's office, Melissa is leading that team, and our great FedRAMP team with Jay and Betsy and Matt and Ashley. Um, this is a concept that, that we were noodling on the FedRAMP team a couple of months ago because I get lots of input from uh, users, clients in the federal space as well as many of you from industry about how certain parts of what we do in the government are not conducive to a greater level of cloud adoption. So we wanted to have this discussion, this interactive discussion, where we had uh, team members from the federal government as well as from industry to come in and help us uh, figure out uh, where we're moving. We're make constantly making adaptations to the way we're doing work and clearly getting more and more volume on the commercial cloud is very important to us in the federal government. Um, I lead a team here in GSA called TTS, Technology Transformation Services, which is a great team of uh, technical men and women that work across the government. Uh, I also am fortunate enough to lead the new IT modernization centers of excellence. And cloud technology is a key piece of, um, of the work that we do. 
We also have the Presidential Innovation Fellows as part of our team in TTS. So all of these really smart men and women are working with federal agencies to actually do work that usually contains some level of cloud, whether it's a PaaS, a SaaS, or um, infrastructure. So what we want to do today is advance the discussion to look at pitfalls, right, things that we want to work around or figure out how we do some level of bridging across certain pitfalls that we have today. But it's also a discussion on things that work, right, and things we want to go faster on. So I am so thrilled when um, I looked at the panels that we have and the team members from industry and the federal government that are going to join us to have this discussion. We want to have a lot more of these interactive sessions where we are talking very practically in terms of how it works for us as we're moving more and more volume to the cloud. So look at this as kind of one of many sessions for us and your input as to the vehicle that we're using here is also we're really interested in like, you know, or do you think this works? Um, so as we're going through these panels, we'd love your ideas about next sessions, topics for additional sessions. Um, so again, your time today, we really appreciate. It's helping all of us in the federal government and obviously our citizens move forward. So thank you. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to John. Thank you. Uh, and we are off. Uh, I believe we would acknowledge, as we have in many of our reverse industry training events, that the bulk of innovation in the United States comes from the private sector. And there is probably no sector of industry more infused with creativity and innovation than the technology sector, where honestly, it just seems like everything changes every 10 minutes. Wait, listen. It just changed again. See, I was telling you about that. So let's listen to our guests, if we can, and the advice that they have about cloud technologies for the federal government or for federal government organizations. Now I say listen, but we certainly welcome you to interact. We have certainly our studio audience, but sometimes the organization here in the auditorium, it's not the easiest to get out of your seat and try to get to a microphone. So please use your information and communication technology devices Email us at the address I gave you before, reverseindustrytraining at gsa.gov, or even the website, reverseindustrytraining.gov. Send us your questions, and we will pass those on to the moderators of our sessions, and they will weave those questions into the discussion, just to make it a more rich and engaging session. For those questions that we can't quite get to, we will compile those in a question and answer document and post it to the Federal Acquisition Institute's media library along with the recording of this event. Again, so we just have a complete record of everything that is going on here. Thank you. Now, to begin with, our first panel, when planning uh, the cloud adoption, the pitfalls, and pro tips. Now, when planning and implementing an enterprise strategy to move to the cloud, I think we have all heard our share of myths and misconceptions, but there are some common pitfalls that we and federal organizations have experienced. And there are also some phenomenal practices though out there and emerging trends that we need to consider. So let's give a listen to our panel if we can. But hey, are you flexible? Me, not so much, but let's try to be flexible. Why is he saying that? Because our deputy boss's schedule is not as flexible. So if you would, Please welcome with me the Deputy Administrator for the U.S. General Services Administration, Allison Brigatti, who would like to make a few remarks to you. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Um, Administrator Murphy was supposed to be giving this speech, um, but she uh, has lost her voice. So she asked me if I could welcome you instead. 
um, and I, she didn't give me much of an of a option. Um, I've <laughs> but I've gladly accepted for three reasons. First, she's my boss, and because of the live streaming, she's probably watching. Um, second, who doesn't love some good acquisition strategy in the morning? Um, and third, because events like today, where we can get candid and honest feedback from our stakeholders, are incredibly valuable. I know that we have a great lineup of speakers this morning. Melissa and Joanne both make great contributions to our agency. Um, Joanne's becoming a uh, public speaking expert. I think this is your fourth industry or reverse industry um, day event that you're speaking at this week. Um, and of course, we're very grateful for the industry expertise that we have in the room with us today as well. Events like this provide us a great opportunity to hear directly from you. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Where are the biggest opportunities to improve? How can we help remove barriers to entry? What best practices can we adopt? Getting answers to these questions is why we are here today, and this feedback is incredibly valuable to us. I joined GSA in the summer of 2017 as the Associate Administrator of the Office of Government-Wide Policy and have served as the Deputy Administrator since December 2018, or 2017. Um, prior to joining GSA, I served as general counsel for a number of organizations, including the National Academy of Public Administration, which is the home of good government. Prior to joining GSA, I served um, also in a number of roles at the World Bank and in real estate. This is my first time working for the federal government. I've spent my career on the other side of the spectrum. So GSA has been a great landing place for me coming into the government from the private and nonprofit sectors because of our unique role working closely with industry and because we have customers, other federal agencies. This important role in mission support puts us in position to create value and for that value to carry a multiplier effect across government. By now I think most people in this room have heard Administrator Murphy's four priorities. But in case you haven't, I'll touch briefly on them, because they really do apply to everything that we're doing here at GSA. Ethical leadership, which means instilling and maintaining confidence from the taxpayers that we are being smart with their money, and being honest brokers with our stakeholders, admitting mistakes when we make them, and taking steps to rectify them. Number two, reducing duplication. I think we've all heard a lot about this priority in the last week. For GSA, this means looking internally first where we can find duplication, whether in contract requirements, systems, or processes, and how can we streamline them. But also across the government, where do shared solutions make sense, and what steps do we need to take to get us to adoption? Three, increasing competition. How do we remove barriers to entry? How do we get the people in this room and those watching on the live stream to bid and compete for work? Enabling more competition benefits both sides. It creates more opportunities for industry to win work, and it gives agencies more options for the products and services that they need. Finally, improving transparency. How can we make more data available for the public and the vendor community that can help them make better informed decisions? How can we better communicate with vendors through the debriefing process? Over these past six months, we've made great strides and covered a lot of ground, all with these priorities in mind. We've rolled out a new strategic plan with an updated mission statement, which is to deliver value and savings in real estate, acquisition, technology, and other mission support services across government. We have four strategic goals that support this mission, and we've released our own agency reform plan, which I oversee. That agency reform plan, originally comprised of 13 specific projects, was developed through employee and stakeholder feedback. And in the interest of reducing duplication, we've consolidated that down to 11. Each of these projects are aligned under one of the four strategic goals. And these projects range across a variety of topics, from making smarter and more informed lease and fleet decisions, to improving the federal buying experience, and making sure our tech programs are aligned. Together, these projects also support a number of other cross-cutting projects, including the President's Management Agenda, which has a focus that I think is of great interest to you today. How do we improve the end product that we provide to taxpayers, specifically through using technology? What lessons can we learn from industry? 
Where can we partner with industry to combine the best innovation the private sector has to offer with the institutional, program, and technical knowledge that we have in our federal workplace? Today's Reverse Industry Day is focused specifically on cloud and IT. I know from speaking with our partners at other agencies that there is a growing interest in moving to cloud-based solutions and taking advantage of the potential they have to enhance mission effectiveness across the government. Before I turn things back over, let me close with this. GSA has experienced the benefits of moving to the cloud firsthand. Not only were we the first agency to offer internet access to all our employees, we were also one of the first to switch to cloud email. We are proud to be leading the effort in several key areas as we assist other agencies in moving to the cloud. Thank you again for being here today, and I hope that you find this event as valuable as we do. Thank you. Audience, again, thank you so much for your flexibility. Truly, you are an intergalactic, proton-powered, electrical, tentacled advertising droid. Nicely done. I appreciate that. Please, then, let me uh, reorient us to what we were talking about, cloud adoption now, a panel discussion on cloud adoption, the pitfalls, and pro tips. We are going to listen to our panel talk about the technical issues that are required for cloud adoption, as well as the skills required to build a cloud-ready workforce. If you would please, to lead this panel, welcome Dan Tucker, Vice President of, of Digital Solutions at Booz Allen Hamilton, and he will introduce the rest of the panel. Thanks, John. Um, so, yeah, as, as John mentioned, uh, I'm a vice president at Booz Allen Hamilton, leading um, in our strategic innovation group, leading uh, cloud and, and data platforms, really everything around helping our customers um, migrate their workloads from an infrastructure perspective, from a platform and container as a service perspective, and up to the up to the application layer. But um, I'm, uh, I'm humbled to be um, here with, with such an esteemed panel uh, today. And so um, Lewis and, and Noah and, and Susie are going to talk to us about their perspectives on, on everything from, from what the workforce looks like, what some of, their, some of the common challenges are, some of the best practices. And you know, I believe we, have, um, we can take some questions from the audience as we go along and, and get some questions online. So, um, you know, I guess I'll start um, maybe on the, on the far end, Lewis, and we can work this way. And folks want to give a little bit about your background and, and maybe just start off with a little bit of perspective on, you know, what you see as the opportunity for the cloud and what do you see as some of the challenges around cloud, just as a high level overview. Great. Thank you very much. Is this on? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dan, and thanks to GSA for uh, hosting this. I, I, Really happy to uh, to be participating. Can I ask? Start off by asking, how many people in the room are government people? Oh, that's, that's, it's refreshing, right? H how many people are industry? No, no slight intended. Okay, very important partners. Um, but uh, particularly for the government uh, uh, people, and how many are non-GSA government? That's my last question. But okay, very interesting. But I'm assuming that. Uh, those, the last group uh, that you all make use of GSA services uh, in one way or another, particularly uh, via acquisition and procurement. Um, I, I feel your pain, right? And I, I, um, I admire uh, your challenges and opportunities. Uh, I used to be a Govy, so I was a, a government, uh, an SES at DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, for uh, five years. Um, uh, it's been a, a long, long time. It was, uh, I came from Silicon Valley right after 9-11 and was there. And um, the way, w so I reported to the CIO. And so like a lot of you, um, I was in an organization that was trying to uh, flatten and streamline, particularly then in time of war. And we were interested in something that didn't exist yet, cloud computing. Um, there was virtualization going on, 
And DIA probably liked GSA because looking back 20 years, DIA had invested in virtualization uh, with VMware, the company I'm with now, VM virtual machines, uh, using software to, uh, to abstract away and to replace a lot of the, uh, the hardware and infrastructure that we used. So every old style organization has been familiar with the data center in the basement. Um, defense intelligence as an enterprise at the time had about 70,000 users globally in over 500 locations. So we were fighting multiple wars. We had lots of people scattered around doing interesting intelligence work uh, uh, on every continent. Uh, 500 plus locations we had, we counted, uh, and I'm sure it was an inaccurate count, and so we used to say 25 plus data centers. It was probably double that. Um, but uh, we did an aggressive, uh, we thought it was ambitious at the time, uh, an aggressive um, effort to do what every federal agency has tried to do uh, since. Uh, we consolidated and we virtualized and we uh, uh, re-architected the entire enterprise down to five global data centers um, and uh, through the architecture providing services uh, across that enterprise from those, uh, we would think of it as a kind of hybrid uh, architecture today, a hybrid environment. It was uh, uh, trying to replace on-prem servers in the basement of every defense and army and navy intelligence facility around the world uh, to provide services smartly and centrally. And in doing so, we saved a lot of money. Uh, and we provided services a lot faster and really optimally. And we had the uh, streamlined environment to actually provide new analytic uh, services and the opportunity to uh, move many of our legacy applications and systems into a, uh, a much smarter, streamlined environment. So it was really win-win all around. Uh, and um, I know we're going to talk, and you're going to hear it not only in our session, but in later sessions about uh, uh, specifics of, of how you accomplish that in today's world, where you have the opportunity with public clouds as well uh, to really be more creative and expansive in what you uh, plan to acquire and deploy, um, particularly because of the complexity that you want to reflect in what you provide to your uh, end users and customers. You want to reflect that complexity, but do so in a really clean, streamlined IT architecture so that your environment makes a lot of sense and you still save the money. Um, that, that's what our business does. Um, but I know that, um, just a last point, um, one thing that you uh, are probably um, anticipating is the uh, what we already heard was the pace of change. And I want to underscore how important it is and how uh, refreshing to have a close partnership between uh, government and industry. Uh, today, if you read headlines, you've seen just in the past 10 days, a lot of, um, I, I think, you know, sitting here in Washington, D.C., a lot of disturbing headlines about um, uh, a growing gulf between uh, homegrown American Silicon Valley companies and the U.S. government. So we've had multiple cases now of uh, controversy uh, with uh, Google and Microsoft and Salesforce and others, uh, Amazon, where employees, uh, kind of small grassroots efforts within those companies uh, to try and divorce those companies from doing work for the government. So I've lived both sides. I've been um, in the government and um, uh, still advise the government as a as counsel, and um, I, I want you to know that the reason we're all here and that um, companies like mine, like VMware, the, the reason we actually partner so closely with the United States government is because it's really critical, the services you provide, and particularly GSA, something that does so much important work for all the other agencies that we saw reflected there uh, in the hands raised. Um, uh, th this is the cutting edge, the front of uh, cloud computing, what uh, serves today as 
end-to-end -end, uh, virtualization of all services. You know, VMware started selling, yeah, it's, 88% of the world's data centers uh, use VMware. Uh, GSA has been using VMware for, I think, 20 years, uh, like my old agency. Um, it started as just virtualizing those uh, x86 servers in the basement, and it now has gone through virtualizing storage and uh, software-defined networks, so abstracting away the network architecture and now doing endpoint management and uh, you know, global IoT uh, management through abstraction. Uh, that's really cutting edge. It's rewarding to see, it's refreshing to see that GSA is having this reverse industry training because the commercial world is, is making some exciting advances. I know that government uh, relies on those and I'm really happy to be here helping. Thanks. Hey, no, just before we get started, I'm getting a little feedback that uh, maybe we just want to make sure we're holding the mic close, just so everyone can hear. Well, no well, problem. I won't repeat everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to either. Um, so my name is Noah Goodman um, with a small company called Art of Management Consulting. Um, I sit between, physically sit between VMware and Microsoft. Um, you know, so I, I, I bring a very different perspective. Um, we are literally a small business. Yeah, we're a under 27.5 NAICS. You know, we're I'm a hub zone company. Um, so we, we have a very different perspective on, on some of these things. Um, my background is within the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I, I've been in DHS from literally the inception. Um, prior to the department standing up, I was with FEMA, um, the Corps of Engineers, working in this emergency management landscape. Um, Coming to my company now, Ardent, uh, we, we started by physically moving infrastructure servers when DHS started doing data center consolidation. Um, we had servers up in coop sites. We had servers out at the national labs. Um, and one of the things we first started working on was physically moving things, U-Hauls, right? Plugging in USB drives, physically moving things down to the data centers when the two data centers at DHS you know, stood up and everybody had data, data center consolidation um, efforts going on. A lot of what we've done since that time um, is deliver applications. We're, we're a pure app dev company. Um, we deliver mission applications. Um, one of the things I was telling Dan earlier is, you know, yes, we're a small business, but we're actually a, a small business behind the scenes. You don't hear about us because we're the guys building the tools that are supporting national operations. Um, we have client spaces across the entire department, um, from Secret Service to headquarters to FEMA to ICE and, and so on and so on. So we've, we've been able to, and I've, I've been able to see the transition of the department, right? The department's still very young um, compared to the rest of the folks around here. So watching the transition of DHS, um, procure IT services, build technologies, consolidate technologies, you know, and now with a lot of the efforts, um, especially with the new CIO in the department, of, of moving to the cloud, right? There's a lot of edict out there about getting out of the data centers. There's milestones to get out of the data centers. Um, so working with the department and being able to move systems, physically move systems, deploy strategies, deploy services and applications into cloud service providers um, is one of our big efforts right now. You know, I, I get to sit on a number of cloud IPTs and CIO councils um, at the headquarters level and across the department. Um, so we, we, we talk about migration patterns and adoption patterns, um, and it's interesting to see because when you look across the department, you have very fast adopters, um, you know, ICE and FEMA, they came out very early. Um, and then you've got others who are still waiting to see how to do this, um, and that's even at the headquarters level. So there's, there's a, a large range of opportunity at the department um, from both the acquisition side as well as the adoption side. Um, on how to get things going. Um, so one of the things I'm, I'm very interested for the, today about is to hear about you know, adoption patterns and migration pathways, um, strategies to do things, you know, as well as hopefully get the chance to talk to you about some of the things we've been doing um, at the department, some of the things we've seen, the pitfalls, um, and really kind of talking through some of this in an honest, open forum. So thank you. Thanks, Noah. Susie? All right, now I'm on. Um, Susie Adams, I'm the CTO for the Microsoft Federal Business. Uh, I live here in the Washington, D.C. region. 
Um, been supporting the federal government for uh, almost 30 years now in a variety of different capacities. I grew up as a technologist, so I was a developer, worked on Navy systems, um, kind of done uh, pretty much, I was a Oracle DBA, a, you know, whatever, whatever the, basically the, U the U.S. government needed. Uh, I was pretty much put in that, you know, learned that role, um, moving up through a consulting arena, and I've been with Microsoft about 20 years now. Um, specifically working with cloud in the federal government since about 2010. How many people remember back in 2010? <laughs> Matt? <laughs> right, and, and when we first started right, with the GSA cloud BPA, that was out there. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, when we were all looking at that RFP that came out, I'm like, wow, you know, this looks like a traditional RFP with just a sprinkle of cloud. All right, and we were trying to figure out how do we actually, you know, what, what is different here, All right? What's the difference between how you would procure a normal software, packaged software product in cloud, All right? And I remember discussions about do we need to change the FAR, All right? Who remembers that? Yeah. All right? And then everybody really being nervous that they couldn't, you couldn't really buy cloud without doing something completely different than what you're doing today. And what we've learned, I think, over the last eight years is that that's not the case. Right. Yes, it's absolutely different model. You know, as Lewis said, and it's virtualizing basically everything. You're going to go from a, a capex model to an opex model. Right. That's different for sure. Right. The pace of change is dramatically different. Right. With our Azure cloud, we literally release new updates 20 times a day, with new pieces of functionality that you're going to want to be able to use without having to go and have some kind type of contract motion. I, and that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around when you think about it. You're like, okay, well, how am I going to do this? And, you know, as we're starting to see, people are starting to, to understand that what we're really trying to do is you have to be a little bit almost more vague in the contracting language of what you're purchasing because you never know how much it's going to change during the period of the contract. Right? And that's tough. That is not an easy thing to wrap your mind around. Right? The other, you know, um, and hopefully today we'll get to some of these other challenges, but I think you know, there are, there are huge differences. How do you, what's the handshake between the, the cloud vendor, like a Microsoft, an Amazon, a Google, a VMware, and the government? Who's responsible for what? What happens if there's a security breach? How do you know where the security breach was? These are all very different things. We're used to um, outsourcing, and there's a single b belly button to push. Now, both sides have responsibilities, right? And it depends, and you need to really think about what those responsibilities are, and make sure you take care of those, both contractually, right, um, and from a technology perspective. Um, I, you know, the last thing I'll say is, back in 2010, I sat on a panel at a, it was a procurement conference, and it was three technologists and a lawyer. And every question we got, when we got to the lawyer, he said, put it in the cloud and the lawyers will come. <laughs> and we were like, what do you mean? <laughs> we had no idea what he was talking about, right? But it just goes, you know, it shouldn't be something you should be scared about. The cloud offers so much capability that we could never get access to. Think about just big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, right? Only the big uh, three-letter agencies were really able to have that type of capability, and on a very limited basis, and it was super expensive, right? Now, anybody can go and create a bot, and you're only going to pay for what you use on a consumption basis. That's huge. Think about data and what you can do with data. Think what, about, about what you can do from a cybersecurity perspective. Right? Being able to find that needle in a haystack without having to look at or run reports or just look at NetFlow data. Right? The world, this gives us such opportunity. And I think it's, you know, the opportunity is really for us to figure out how to accelerate that adoption inside the federal government so that we don't fall behind. Because the world is using the cloud. Right? It is not, it's, it's not a, a, something that's go, going to go away. And we need to learn to, how to quickly snap into that model. Awesome. Thanks, Susie. So maybe we can start, um, before we get to the good stuff on the best practices, maybe we can start with maybe from each of you, you know, what's a key challenge that you've seen with a, with a cloud migration effort? You know, was it the strategy? Was it the technology, the security, the, the workforce? I, I'd, I'd love to hear from, from each one of you kind of, you know, where was something that if you could go back and do something differently or worked in engagement where, to, you know, something could be done differently with, this, with respect to cloud migration, anywhere from acquisition through delivery. 
Um, I'd appreciate a perspective on that. I guess I'll start. We'll go back this way. Um, so I think there's a couple things. The first is uh, most people think they can just go procure the cloud and connect it, and they're done. Um, it's, it's not like that. You have to go in, and clean up your own house. Right? You have to make sure you have a good security strategy. You have to make sure right, that you understand the handshake between you and the cloud provider that's giving you those services. Um, you know, some of the agencies that we've dealt with hadn't, uh, hadn't looked at their act, active directory in 10 years, had not cleaned it up, had not looked at their network infrastructure, did not have an inventory of the applications that were running, right? And all kinds of integration issues occurred right off the bat, which almost, it stops you dead, right, in your tracks. You really have to look at what's going on inside your environment today, have a good strategy for how you're gonna connect to the network. That's probably one of the biggest hurdles out there. The second is have a good strategy for how you're going to remain compliant, right, with FedRAMP. It's how you're going to get applications through your internal uh, FedRAMP approval processes after you're connected to the cloud, because each application needs one. And what we're finding is, once you get through the hurdles of connecting the cloud to your environment, you have a uh, directory, right, an identity approach, and you're looking at the and you're looking at building apps. The next thing is, once you build the app, nobody can consume it because it isn't compliant. And so you've spent a year getting onto the cloud with almost seeing little or no value. And so these are things that you really need to think about um, right at the beginning so that you can make sure that once you're connected that you can easily take advantage and start to migrate applications right, and, and, take to, and use these. The, the last thing that I think we see um, a lot of agencies is change management. All right, helping your end users understand what's different making sure that they know what, you know what the guidelines are from moving to the cloud, right? And then uh, make sure you have a management strategy. How are you going to manage those resources that are in the cloud, right? Most every agency um, today is using at least one cloud, if not more. How many people are in an agency today that are using three different cloud providers for different services? Really? Not that many. How about two? A couple hands. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> how many there are. Right? And so when I look at, I think we've got a little. Is this better? No. It's mine. Yeah, we're going to pass. Okay, that's better. Um, it, and what we're seeing is you have to have a management strategy for this, and you have to understand how the billing and chargeback is going to work, right? And put that management strategy in place. And I think if those, if you can work through those four things, those are the biggest hurdles we see from for cloud adoption. Um, it's not necessarily acquisition as much as it is once you've acquired it. Now, how do you actually uh, implement it and start using it? Yeah, so I, I cannot echo enough what Susie just said, and I'll probably just bolt on to a couple of those things, a couple of those key topic areas. Um, you know, the, the concept of technical debt, right? The, the concept of, you know, you have legacy infrastructure, legacy software, legacy applications and services. When you look to move to the cloud, um, you have to know that debt. Um, you have to know that debt ahead of time before you start planning into what you have to do next. Um, you know, that gets into some of the conversations about you know, your strategies, whether it's, you know, lift and shift and refactor and re-engineer and, uh, and all these different things that you can do with the applications. But you have to understand what you have in-house right now. Um, so one of the things I'll, I'll probably harp on a, a bunch over the this morning is, uh, is planning. Um, I, I have the honor, I guess, um, of living this right now. We're moving uh, one of our major systems out of one of the data centers, um, moving up to GovCloud, and we we are going through a plan right now in understanding how to get this thing out of there. This is a national special security exemption system. Um, it's a 24 seven operational entity, right? So we've got a lot of challenges about how to get this thing physically out of the data center and moved up into the cloud. Um, working with your security teams, your security assessment teams, your assessors, um, physically grabbing them, right? Having them with you. Um, you can't do this without having people on board whether it's your program managers, your system owners, or your author authorization officials. Um, 
one of the things we, we dealt with last year was we just got a, uh, our three-year ATO, and then we said, oh, sorry, we're about to move to the cloud, right? And, and our security officer said, what the hell are you doing, right? I just spent all these resources ATO in you, right? And now you're telling me you're going somewhere else and I have to re-ATO you. Um, you know, so the ability for us to take him and literally sit down with him and talk through how we're going to do this, right? The plan to do this, the things we have to understand about the system, um, these are absolutely critical. So don't shortchange yourself on a planning phase. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things out there, are, you know, we, we want to get there fast and we want to get adoption fast. You know, and maybe we're time boxed and we're constrained and somebody says you have to be out by a certain date. Well, don't shortchange planning. Don't shortchange the effort that it takes to get people in the room. <clears throat> you know, whether you have to physically move people into rooms and talk through these challenges. Um, you know, pay attention to that. Um, and that gets into understanding your system, like Susie said, like the, the concept of, of debt, right? So what are you bringing up? What do you have to re-engineer? What can you just simply move into the cloud? Um, those are probably some of the biggest things <clears throat> we've seen over probably the past five years um, in working with some of these mission systems and moving them up. Um, and again, I, I, I'll say it again, like planning, planning, planning. Do not shortchange planning. Everything they said. Um, to answer Dan's question, so I, th I think one of the biggest pitfalls is actually um, that we fool ourselves a lot. Uh, on cloud adoption. And we do that in two ways. Number one, uh, from a government perspective, we fool ourselves sometimes with, a, you know, senior management, close your ears here. Um, uh, IT often uh, <clears throat> inadvertently leaves a misleading um, impression in the minds of senior, senior, senior leadership, and this may not be the case with uh, Ms. Murphy, but in other agencies of, okay, we're going to the cloud. We've decided to go to the cloud. We've adopted the cloud. I have a hunch that some of you who didn't answer to Susie's question, how many of you, your agencies are using three or more clouds? I have a hunch, even if you didn't raise your hand, you might be um, unwittingly. And that may be uh, an inadvertent or a um, by choice uh, function of the reality of the complexity of your enterprises. Uh, when you, um, I'll put it this way, when, when we talk with commercial customers, large scale commercial customers, Wall Street, uh, you know, global financial enterprises, what they actually ask for is give me a unified digital platform. Help me have a digital platform that's ubiquitous and is capable of supporting everything end-to-end -end virtualized from on-premise data centers, which I'm still going to have for at least a while, and in some cases for security and other um, uh, governance purposes forever, through uh, hybrid cloud and public cloud integration, multiple cloud environments. Multi-cloud environments are, uh, are not the enemy, they're the reality. And so what you really want is the ability to manage that complexity um, and, and gain the advantages of cost and risk and performance that, uh, that uh, using uh, cloud services provides. But understanding that, don't kid yourself, that you're going to be um, supporting a multivariate kind of a complex hybrid environment in any case. And you know, talk to industry, which actually does that, um, and provides that for customers. It's, um, it's, it's one of the, uh, we, we talked about procurement, Susie mentioned, uh, you know, the, the uh, impossibility of, um, of having, um, you know, uh, kind of transitioning legacy FAR-based rules to uh, modern cloud acquisition and procurement, I think that uh, some of the, uh, I saw some of the other sessions during the day are going to be talking specifically about what acquisition officers uh, and practices um, um, are doing in terms of uh, uh, new approaches for uh, paying for consumption-based services. Um, one of the, uh, the other aspect of fooling ourselves, I think, is 
that uh, all of these cost savings from moving to cloud services can be immediately transitioned into, um, uh, into other mission services. One of the things to keep in mind, a best practice, a, a pro tip uh, that um, uh, commercial practices use is anticipate that you, it's um, what Noah was saying about planning, anticipate that some of the uh, savings that you reap from lower cost services provided through uh, cloud, some of that money you're actually going to want to retain within IT for innovation purposes. Um, I think of, um, if I'm not mistaken, GSA's budget's like 10 billion, something like that. 10.7 billion is, the, is next year's uh, request. Uh, that's roughly the same size as VMware. VMware's $9 billion revenue company. How much of the, um, of the IT budget, uh, how much of that revenue of that 10 billion goes to I don't know, a standard industry metric for Silicon Valley for tech companies, R&D. In R&D, uh, a kind of best practice metric for um, traditional corporate companies is try to spend three to 5% of your revenue on R&D. Uh, for tech companies, Valley aggressive, innovative companies, you shoot for 10% or more. Uh, Amazon spends 12% of its revenue on R&D, Microsoft spends about 13%. Um, the kind of young, really um, cutting edge companies, Facebook spends 19% this past year of its uh, revenue on R&D. VMware uh, this past year, 21%. All right, so 21% of a budget about the size of GSA. We're spending a fifth of that nine billion, one out of every $5 on R&D. Can you imagine what GSA services would be like if you were spending, oh, I don't know, $2 billion a year on, on R&D? You've got the IT modernization fund, which is what, like 110 million, I think. Um, one of the things you'll be able to do in planning as you, uh, you and your other agencies continue to adopt cloud services and move to the new paradigm is you'll be able to actually reinvest the savings both to mission but also within your, uh, your IT enterprises to be able to actually afford to do true innovation. And that's another uh, aspect where industry can help. Just to add to what um, Lewis said, when I think of the term IT modernization, I go back in my head and I'm thinking, I'm gonna take an application and I'm gonna go get the requirements and I'm just gonna use newer technology to implement the same process. The way that we think about IT modernization is more digital transformation. It's not doing things the same way. You have new tools available to you that allow you to be really innovative in how agencies provide citizen services, right? how you secure those services. Um, the capabilities really are endless. And so what we're encouraging agencies to do is they look towards moving to the cloud is not look to take everything they have today using the same process right, to the cloud. It's actually to try to be innovative right, and look at the new capabilities and the new technologies that are out there that could help you deliver more innovative services right, and maybe sunset a lot of what you already have, right, which will help you even save more. Right, so I do, I, I do think that if you can think about it that way, right, and think of it more as a transformation instead of a modernization, right, in the traditional modernization type of you know, contracts that we usually see out there, right, this, it should be, they should say digital transformation, really. That's an excellent point, Susie. Um, since you each touched on it, um, so 10 years ago, cloud, eight years ago, hybrid cloud, now over the past couple years, multi-cloud. Um, can you guys talk to me each about kind of the pros and cons of, of a multi-cloud architecture versus maybe a, a, a single you know, commercial cloud infrastructure? Um, I think it was IDC like last year that said that every major corporation will have a multi-cloud hybrid infrastructure 
by 2018. All right, so think about that. Every major corporation. You know, today, I think it's already true across the federal government, whether you're using Salesforce and Amazon or Salesforce and Microsoft or Amazon and Microsoft together, right? Or, you know, have Dropbox or you could, the list goes on, right, of all the different cloud tools you could potentially be using, right? Um, I think the challenge with multi-cloud is what I like to call cloud creep where you have you know, the behind the scenes folks just using any cloud that they want to use, which is obviously a huge security vulnerability to not know where your data lives. And so what you're really seeing now in the IT industry is a lot of emphasis on how do you manage your hybrid infrastructure? How do you know what cloud services your end users are actually using? How do you know where your data is? And instead of securing your, your perimeter, your security perimeter has changed. It's no longer guards and gates and guns, right? And just your contractors that are out there. Uh, and you know, the, at the network edge is, is, you know, all data is protected. You now need to look at and follow data regardless of where it lives. And that's a huge paradigm shift from a security perspective, right? And so what you're seeing now are tools coming out to help you manage that. And the reason these tools are coming out and they're, and, and they're not expensive is because of the cloud, because these tools live in the cloud and they help you manage this new digital estate that spans data in your data center on legacy systems, data in the Microsoft cloud, the Amazon cloud, the VMware cloud, the, regardless of where it lives on any device, right? And gives you that, that perspective of who's using what, where data is going and, and helps you uh, manage that environment. Now, are the tools everything you need to truly be multi-cloud and feel safe? We probably still have some work to do in the industry to to make these, you know, truly enterprise, you know, uh, for for very large organizations. You know, there are still some gaps that are out there, but they're not big gaps, right? And those gaps will be closed in a matter of months, not a matter of years. Right? And so you're going to start to be able to see that this is not a big deal you will be able to visually see where your data lives and be able to manage that, right? And it'll be ubiquitous. You, you just won't, it won't matter anymore. And so, you know, I truly think that multi-cloud, we're already here. Um, and I think that you're gonna see, you know, the, the, the challenge really is understanding how to manage it um, and getting up to speed on all the new technologies that are out there. That was, um an interesting statistic about 2018 and multi-cloud, right? So we're a 120-person company, right? We run Office 365, Salesforce. Um, we've got our dev sites in Amazon. Like, that's crazy, right? We're a 120-person company, um, and yet we are in this multi-cloud environment. Um, same can be said for a lot of my customers, um, you know, especially in the mission side. Um, you, you look at FEMA. Um, you know, FEMA deploys people to the edge, right? Now, we have to also you know, send data to those people at the edge. <clears throat> so one of the things we look at um, when we're building some of the applications is how can we get these services, this content, this data, both at the consumption side and the ingest side, as far out as possible and still in a secure mechanism. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things we, we work with at FEMA is, is around damage assessment. Um, you know, so post-disaster, you're sending thousands of people out into the community to do damage assessment. They're using mobile tools. They're in network limited environments. Um, so how do you secure the ingest as well as the, the dissemination of that data? So in multi-cloud environments, one of the things we have to look at is not just the hosting of the infrastructure, not just the hosting of the, of the applications, but how are we moving that data out? How are we moving the data to the edge? Um, so you know, we, we, we see this daily. We, we live this daily. Um, and the security apparatus that has to fit around this is absolutely instrumental. So as these, these services advance, as the security apparatus advances, and we can take advantage of multi-cloud institutions, um, you, you're gonna see more capability being able to push farther and farther out. Um, and that's one of the things we're, we're very interested in. Um, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear about and, and listen to Susie and, and Lou talk about from you, you know, the big industry side, because these are the things that I have to take advantage of as an application owner, as a developer, with working with my clients, I have to rely on these capabilities and these services. So as they come out, it's now up to us to figure out how do we implement them? How do we use them? How do we secure them? <clears throat> how do we work with our acquisition teams to get there? How do we work with our security officials to secure them? And so forth. So um, it, it's, a, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very, very interesting dynamic. 
um, moving away from traditional, you know, on-prem traditional one cloud environment to now this multi-cloud environment. Thank you. Um, I, I think the, the best advice to anybody asking themselves uh, about um, uh, whether or not we're going to have a multi-cloud environment is to embrace the reality that uh, Susie and Noah uh, talked about. Embrace the reality. When we walked in here, uh, people were setting up the slides, and we saw that uh, GSA uses uh, Gmail, uh, Google Suite, uh, and also PowerPoint. And I would suspect that somewhere here in the building, or at least in the um, you know in the app dev world of uh, GSA, and certainly its customers, uh, that there is a lot of open source uh, uh, app development and app support. Uh, that's the reality. That's what I mean about not fooling ourselves. Embrace that kind of complexity because it actually provides the flexibility that you need to provide the kinds of diverse and uh, you know multivarious services that your customers need. That's it's kind of the GSA way, right? I mean, GSA is the you know the unseen electricity providing a variety of real estate and acquisition and technology and a wide variety of mission supporting services uh, ubiquitously across the government. Uh, and you know, when somebody comes to you with what they think is a unique and new and uh, exotic request, you've probably heard it before, you already do that somewhere else in a corner of the government. That's what you actually uh, want to be able to architect and construct uh, and manage uh, in your uh, hybrid cloud environment. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, uh, the, <coughs> the, the roots of VMware uh, are in this very construct. VMware, if you think back, it's 20 years old now. 20 years ago, it was exotic to be able to have on a single piece of hardware, on a single server, to have in a processor running multiple operating systems to be able to boot up two instances of Windows or one of Windows and one of Linux or um, of Mac OS. That became exotic and yet it also it was kind of the emblematic implementation of Moore's Law where all of a sudden you could do uh, multi-server virtualization on a single piece of hardware and you know it just skyrockets in terms of the complexity you're able to manage, the flexibility you're able to offer, the vast performance that you're able to, uh, to provide at increased levels at less cost. So that's sort of the magic of technology that, uh, uh, that, that we all love. Um, embrace that. There are uh, new tools and uh, methodologies to be able to um, provide managerial automation for the management of that kind of complexity. Um, that's what industry is doing um, in using particularly machine learning. That's where uh, most of us see the, I'm on the VMware research side in the R&D team, so that's where we're spending that massive investment is in putting within all of the automation of all of the complex orchestrations of services, uh, automating as much as possible. So, you know, the, the phrase that uh, VCs like to use, I think Mark Andreessen originally, Software eats the world. Everything's becoming software. Um, the answer to that question is embrace that kind of aggressive uh, new opportunity of new managerial automation and virtualization through software. It's really exciting. Awesome, good stuff, Lewis. So I heard each of you talk about cloud as this enabler for digital transformation. And I heard each of you talk about multi-cloud and different architectures and infrastructures to address different services that are also needed um, for that for that you know digital transformation we think about moving to the cloud and we think about embracing the cloud there's um, I think a lot of different approaches there's well we could lift and shift we can move our workloads over there and there we're in the cloud um, or we could take this maybe far to the right spectrum, going from cloud ready to cloud native. You know, maybe I'll start with you, Noah, since you talked about planning, and, and maybe then Susie also, since you touched on 
change management. You know, how, how should an organization think about, hey, here's my portfolio of, of stuff, here's my apps, you know, what should I lift and shift, if anything? You know, how do I go down that roadmap of, of actually moving my workloads, and how do I go through that decision process? I'd appreciate your perspectives on that. Sure. Um, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm living this in, in real life right now. Um, the, one of the things that we, we, we have to deal with with some of our systems, um, like, and I said this earlier, was some of the time constraints, the time box, right? Um, working with my product owners, my system owners, um, my PMs in the federal space as well as on my teams, um, what we have to do is just a constant deep dive, a constant dialogue, a constant um, decoupling of what we're trying to do in the cloud. Um, you know, if, there, if it is a race, right, it's a race, right? I, I have an edict to get to the cloud as fast as possible. Um, I don't want to sacrifice quality. I don't want to sacrifice performance. Um, so part of that planning phase is really trying to understand um, what not only the models are to do this, um, but I said earlier as well about the concept of technical debt, right, is, is really trying to look at your application, understand what it is, what do you have, both at the infrastructure level, at the services level, at the security level, um, and then how do, you, how do you decompose that into what you need in the future, and how do you migrate that? You know, one of the things, you know, in typical data center operations, you know, somebody else, as Susie said earlier, somebody else is responsible for that. Right, somebody's your network operations team, somebody's your security operations team, somebody's providing you know, internet and border firewall protection and so forth. Well, now all of a sudden, that's, that's your job, right? You have to plan for this. You have to figure out how you're gonna do this. Um, you know, so one of the things that, that we've been challenged with is a time constraint. Um, it, that's fine, that's the way the world's gonna be. Um, but we have to constantly work with our, our team members, our product owners, our system owners, um, to help them understand what that means. If lift and shift is the fastest way to do this, it's the fastest way to do this, but you have to understand what you're gonna carry with you when you do that. Um, you know, similarly, I'm gonna harp on this again and again about the security side of it. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we're challenged with is the concept of, of like tenants, right? So you have a, a general support service, a GSS, and now all of a sudden you're, you, you have tenants that have to plug into this. Well, there has to also be a security mechanism to be able to do this. So working with your security officials, working with uh, the assessment teams, and being able to say, all right, I now got to plug in, I got to re-ATO, I got to do all these things. How do I decouple, how do I decompose my systems and my applications to be able to do that? And you know, what's the speed and what's the scale for me to be able to get, get there? Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's going to vary, right? It's going to vary at the portfolio level. It's going to vary at the maturity of the agency and the department. Um, maybe you have mature um, programs in migration strategy. Maybe you don't. Um, maybe you have time constraints. Maybe you have fiscal constraints. Um, so it's really trying to get to the, to the bottom um, and really decompose the why you're doing this what you're trying to get out of the future, what you're trying to do in the cloud. Um, and that approach is gonna help you understand whether it's true lift and shift, whether it's cloud native, you know, whether it's you know, containerization, whether it's taking advantage of services and microservices and all these great things that we can do with our applications. Um, because if you don't understand that, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be saddled with the debt in the future, right? You're gonna sacrifice the quality, you're gonna sacrifice something in the future if you make kind of rush to the judgment decisions and, and so forth. Uh, so I completely agree with Noah. <laughs> um, you know, I think, uh, so I was working with a, a large branch of the military and this one group, uh, we went in to talk with them and they said, we have 600 systems of record that we all think have authoritative data in it. I'm like, 600? I'm like, do you know what they all are? Well, no, we're, we're documenting that now. And when you think about just that concept alone, right, when it comes to you know, having, getting your own house in order, Right? I think it really starts with, you know, you have to do that inventory. You have to know where your data is, who's using those systems of record, right? Are those systems of record still needed, right? Is that process even in place still today? Because a lot of times it's not, right? And you don't have to do this all manually. And I think that was probably the most shocking piece 
right, was that, you know, the way, and this mirrors my background as an as a, uh, architect, I've gone on co in countless government agencies and you go and you document all the systems and you draw nice little flow charts in Visio and you say this is where the data flows and you have a big notebook about this thick, right? And, and this is how we used to go about documenting IT systems. In today's world, you can automate a lot of this. You can actually run tools on your network that will tell you what systems are connected to what data stores, are they being used, what networks are they on, have they been patched, have they been updated, right? And, and the list goes on. And so we really encourage um, our government customers to, to take advantage of automation as best as they can. And this, this is, this can be a cultural challenge because people, uh, especially security professionals, are not happy, right, with w running these tools that they don't really understand on top of all these systems, right? But it is really, it, it gives you so much more intelligence about what's actually going on as opposed to just trusting, you know, somebody that might have just, you know, started work last week on um, whether a system is needed or not. Um, get all that data, um, do the IT inventory, and then I think you have to go through, just as Noah said, that process of trying to, what am I gonna digitally transform? From a te technical perspective, there are good, better candidates than others for lift and shift. Some you can't, right? It just won't work. Um, some would cost you more. You have to look at, the, there's, uh, there's you know, obviously uh, security reasons not to move things. There's uh, business justifications not to move things. Is the application actually end of life so that you could go cloud, go cloud native? Right, on your next on the on the next uh, tool that goes in to to help that process, and so you know it isn't a one size shoe fits all. Um, it just isn't. There isn't a, a cookbook for you know just migrate this one if it does this, uh, and kind of go down and go through a checklist. You actually have to go uh, and do the work, right, and actually sit down. And there are, we do you know we have a process. I'm sure VMware everybody has uh, a process out there that all pretty much looks similar. All right, they just, we just name it something different um, to actually walk you through the kind of that application rationalization process, knowing your hardware inventory, understanding, you know, what the, the, the uh, value would be, right, from both a business and a cost perspective of migrating something to the cloud. All right, so I remember, who remembers the, the edict about XML? Everything has to be XML. You remember that? That's a long time ago. So the analogy I like to use here is that and I'm not kidding, I can't tell you how many government agencies took running applications perfectly fine in production and said, well, we have to XML enable them when it gave no value whatsoever to the application, none. No, no value whatsoever. And so it's the same thing here. If, if, if it, it, there may not be any value to moving one piece or one application to the cloud. And if that's the case, don't move it. Right? You're going to live in a hybrid world. Right? So it's not an all or nothing type of thing. You really have to sit, sit down and analyze your portfolio and make both a business justification for the move as well as making sure that it's technically feasible and that you're getting some value, right, business or innovation value out of moving it to the cloud. So I have a probably 20 year old XML for dummies book on my bookshelf. <laughs> Someone came in my office and said, really? I was like, yeah, I should probably do something with that. Um, hey, so I wanna um, let the audience think of a, a couple questions because I know we're about to, to wrap up, but um, I do wanna um, maybe start with Lewis. Um, you know, so everyone's kind of talked about maybe there's a, maybe the, the, the cloud isn't right for some workloads or some applications. Um, I'd appreciate your perspective on that. In the interest of time, absolutely, of course not. Um, I mean, I do a lot of work in the DOD and IC space, and they are going to, at best, use on-premise, um, uh, if not, you know, individual server-based uh, provision of, of uh, a service, of a capability, but you want that data to be within the enterprise and addressable within security parameters, you want that data and the results of whatever data exploitation are gonna be. So, uh, you know, embrace the complexity of being able to manage the full enterprise um, uh, where you, you certainly have to um, admit to yourselves and to leadership that in our acquisition and procurement decision, we're not 
doing anything for 100% of the capabilities that our enterprise is going to provide. We're providing the flexibility to support all of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, as you've heard today, you're, you embrace the hybridity of, uh, of your environment. So just to maybe piggyback on that, just for as, as a follow-up, you know, but I know a lot of the cloud service providers are getting their, you know, IL-5, impact level 5, and FedRAMP high. Is that still not appropriate enough? Or? No, it's absolutely appropriate, and, um, you know, that's, that's exactly what we're targeting for this year. Uh, but it's... Um, um, how many people are here are in the DOD space? You know, not not that many. Um, it is a vast, uh, you know, it's a, a large proportion of the federal IT spend. But in terms of the services that GSA uh, supports, uh, there's a lot. It's It's like big data. I mean, not every government enterprise has the need for the kinds of algorithmic scale and complexity of Facebook, which has 2.4 billion users around the world. So it's kind of, you know, big data for the rest of us, cloud computing for the rest of us. You want to be able to, um, you know, manage uh, the, the universal digital platform that includes on-premise capabilities as well as in a, a multi-cloud environment. Awesome, good stuff. Um, questions from the audience? Anyone? D -d -d is there one? You're going to hand me a laptop. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take the first one. Way. When you move to a cloud solution, what data migration considerations are important to consider so that data from legacy systems are still usable? Who would like to tackle that? See if that still works. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, uh, what data to move, boy? Um, you know, some some of the, you know, especially in my world, right? In 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 the security world. Um, we, we deal with sensitive PII, PII, we deal with law enforcement data, we deal with all these things, right, all these caveats around data. Um, we have one of the challenges that we, we actually face right now um, is the ability to physically go down to a data center and plug a device in to actually get our data off. Um, <laughs> you know, that, it sounds kind of silly, right, but that's, that's a challenge that we have. Um, y you know, so, what data to move, you know, when, when it comes to the world I live in, you know, it's, it's, it's mission systems, right? So we, we know the data. Um, a lot of our data is fairly static, but there is intransient data. Um, you know, so for us, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easier game to understand. When you, when you start looking at, like, big platforms like, you know, SharePoint and, and big file repositories and content stores, you know, that, that game gets a little different. Um, but in, in our world, you know, knowing what data to move is really going to be at the application level. It's going to be what data has to be protected, how do you protect it, how do you protect it in transit, and so forth. Um, so I, I think I might be a little different than, than the other guys here. Um, but, yep. uh, one quick point is in your planning uh, on data, and many people know this now, but don't only think about data that resides in databases. That's where we all were 20 years ago, 10 years ago, for a lot of systems still today. But what we see a lot increasingly in the government space and certainly ubiquitously in the uh, uh, commercial space is an interest in all of the data produced from endpoints. Uh, GSA supports you know, hundreds of thousands of government employees, all of whom are walking around with computational devices that produce and store and, and use data. And we've got the Internet of Things and um, the ability to through uh, multi-cloud environments and the analytic services that can uh, uh, reside on them flexibly, the ability to actually do health management and um, you know, real-time um, uh, monitoring of events across the broad enterprise of facilities and locations and devices within all of those locations, I would think for GSA is going to be really important. So it's a it's a new way to think about the full environment of data that you're going to be able to support through uh, a multi-cloud environment. 
Awesome, thanks, Louis. So one last question, um, and then we will we'll break. Um, I thought this was interesting. Um, is there something we can do to improve the FedRAMP process for industry? It feels like some agencies are still challenged getting to that ATO um, gate. <laughs> With Matt sitting in the front row. <laughs> Um, it, you know, I, I think when, well, first of all, I'll be, uh, we'll just be candid here. We work a lot with Matt and we've actually, uh, are very happy with where FedRAMP is right now and, and where they're going and how the process has changed since the very beginning. Um, you know, cause it is, it is a challenge. I mean, if you look at the controls, sometimes some of the controls, um, the way that people want to interpret them is traditionally old school. And when you look at when you look at the cloud, everything is virtualized. Everything is software defined everything. We don't have hardware load balancers, right? So when you read our security package, I think the biggest challenge for agencies is not the FedRAMP process itself, right? It's how to interpret how cloud providers are actually implementing those controls, right? Because the technology we're using is so different than what was used in the past on premise. And I think that is the biggest challenge and the biggest hurdle to overcome is when you start reading this thousand page document and it's a thousand pages a traditional uh, system security plan might have been 20 <laughs> in the past for something on premise and it was something you could touch and go look at and unplug from the network you now have to trust you have to read this document look at new software defined uh, firewalls networking that you've never seen before at a hyperscale level with data centers that are all over the country and interpret that and interpret how we meet that control all by reading a thousand pages, right? And so I think that's the biggest challenge right now with the cloud, uh, with the cloud security controls is how do I make heads or tails out of this? And then uh, people taking a literal interpretation of a control, right? And saying, well, you didn't implement it this way. Well, that's because you don't do it that way in the cloud. It doesn't make sense to do it that way in the cloud. And here's why, and here's how we're mitigating that risk. And so we spend a lot of time, uh, frankly, doing that. And you know, it's been a learning process for the cloud providers and for government. I remember the very first time we went through um, with Azure, getting our FISMA ATO with GSA. I can remember the conversations we had, painstaking, in a room at GSA over each control. And I'm not kidding, each control. And it was, it was unbelievable. We, it was both an educational experience for our compliance team, as well as the people on the other side who had never really understood how hyperscale clouds run behind the scene. So I think that's the challenge. I don't think there's a process problem there. I think it's more of a learning type of a thing. Great. All right, thanks, Susie. So um, I want to thank Susie and, and Noah and Lewis. This was energizing and educational for me. I hope it was for you. Also, thank you to, to GSA. I hope folks got a lot out of it. And uh, thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you. Guys. Panel, thank you all so very much. And again, as always, our audience, thank you very much. As I mentioned before, we had a boatload of questions come in and unfortunately ran out of time with those questions, but we're going to post a question and answer document, as I said, with a recording of this event in FAI's media library with the other reverse industry training recordings. Now, right now, we do not have a formal break. We are essentially shuffling the characters uh, for presentation. And while that happens, I will slow down and speak more slowly to give us a little bit of time, but then introduce the next subject that's coming up. And that is buying the cloud. Now you all know this last panel discussion was thick with knowledge about technology strategies surrounding cloud adoption, no doubt about it. And as agencies develop and execute an overall cloud acquisition strategy or cloud adoption strategy, translating those technical strategies into acquisition strategies can result in an awful lot of confusion between industry and government throughout the entire acquisition process. And like I said, the last panel introduced a thick amount of knowledge and information when it came to those various technology strategies. 
Um, and for these, for this reason, it always comes back to clarity in our solicitations, where the contracting officer, contracting specialist, the project manager, the contracting officer's representative really need to work closely with one another in defining their requirements. In the performance work statement, in the statement of objections, objectives, whatever it might be, clarity is going to be the key. And for these as-a-service offerings, there's also important legal and budget planning considerations. Industry experts here in our next panel are going to share their interpretation of the typical requirements seen in solicitations and, of course, provide suggestions to improve our future solicitations. So if I may introduce again to lead our panel, please welcome Joe Cloyd, Director of National Security Solutions at Northrop Grumman. Thanks, John. I'm used to being uh, called Cloud by most, uh, Mr. Cloud by most telemarketers, so uh, this is the one time it would probably be appropriate. Uh, I'm going to invite our panelists to join us at the table. Um, and as they're doing so, I'm going to do some brief introductions. Uh, John did mine. I'm the director of National Security Solutions, operating unit at Northrop Grumman, um, focusing on system modernization for a lot of our federal civilian national security customers. What John didn't know is that I'm a tech fellow emeritus, uh, primarily uh, because of interest in cloud computing. And so I'm uh, thrilled to be up here with this esteemed panel. Um, so for some brief intros then, uh, first, uh, on my immediate left, um, we have uh, Shannon Silverstein. Shannon leads the DHS and Department of Justice portfolio at Cloudera Government Solutions, where she's assisting those customers with leading big data initiatives and transformation to cloud computing. Next to Shannon then in the middle is uh, Mr. Jonathan Album, and he's public sector CTO or Chief Technology Officer at Veritas Technologies, where he guides his team and federal customers in implementing multi-cloud uh, data management, data protection, and, and storage optimization solutions. Prior to joining uh, the uh, private sector, Jonathan was also CIO at the USDA where he led IT modernization efforts. And then uh, finally, Jay Hajir. You're going to hear more from Jay uh, shortly this afternoon as well um, for an additional session. But uh, Jay is CEO of Practical Solutions, where he has led IT modernization and cloud adoption for federal clients, including the Small Business Administration. And that'll be the, uh, the specific topic of the next uh, session as well. So with that, um, I'm going to try to put us on sort of a rapid pace here, only because I really want to make sure that we're able to um, cover questions from the audience and, and questions from the eight or 900 folks uh, online. And so um, I'm going to tee it up with a, a quick uh, question to maybe uh, start things off. I will be the first to admit that we are all guilty of lots and lots of acronyms and, uh, and terms that we use. We don't always know what they mean, but we especially appreciate that maybe everybody in the audience doesn't know that. So if you hear us getting on the wrong side of an, acro of an acronym, shoot your hand up. That'll be my cue to pause us and, and get some definition there. Um, so the first question, and, and maybe we'll start um, with Jay, uh, um, taking it uh, initially, and that's just, can you give us a brief overview of your background uh, as it relates to experience in bidding and, and delivering cloud services? And, and the piece I'll throw out there is keep in mind, we're from industry, so we don't always write the solicitations, but we do spend time reading them, that's for sure. So uh, a lot of the context in which we'll be addressing things is that industry perspective on the government acquisition process and government solicitations. So Jay, with that. Hello. Yes. Um, thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you for GSA and the rest of the audience. Uh, my name is Jay Hajir. I um, started uh, Practical Solutions about 21 years ago uh, this month. And uh, in it, we were focused purely on uh, strategy, technology, engineering, and management. A lot of times when we actually were brought in is to fix something that is difficult. And rightly so, I actually the, our theme through practical solutions about turning chaos to order. Um, a lot of it, a lot of times, is we actually brought in because it is a challenging uh, environment, and they uh, have to actually do it and, and and step in with both deep technical uh, engineering and technology, and even taking the management as well as the strategy. So we uh, structure the strategy, help be a trusted partner with uh, typically in the CIO and the management team. And then take it from basically addressing the solutions, uh, addressing the, the issues, what they are, 
and then working through the implementations. And lately, we've been doing for the last 18 months helping the uh, U.S. Small Business Administration with their journey to the cloud. And um, it's been an interesting journey because we had to actually develop uh, a very quickly a very quick strategy that we turned it into executions and then and trying to worry about all the different multi-cloud capabilities that the Small Business Administration has and trying to get out of the data center. There's a lot of challenges. And um, trying to keep the themes just purely focused on the acquisition. And um, acquisition of the cloud itself is also a challenge by itself as we throw lots of terminologies and trying to figure out, well, how do I procure cloud? There's not one thing that is called a cloud. So analogies a lot of times helps, trying to figure out exactly what the difference is between infrastructure as a service, trying to platform as a service, or software as a service. And uh, hopefully, I've, in the following uh, answers, I'll be able to actually feed you in and what our interpretation of these particular procurement is and try and actually educate uh, the leadership as well as ed educating the, um, the procurement officers what and how to acquire the cloud. Thanks. Thank you. We'll work our way this way. So, Jonathan, next, if uh... sure. Thank you. So, um, you know, as, as, Joy me as Joe mentioned, uh, Joe Cloud mentioned. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, you know, I spent uh, the. I I'm new at Veritas uh, Technologies as a CTO. I was previously um, an employee in the federal government. I was senior executive. I worked in a number of jobs at USDA, including the CIO for USDA. But I also worked at GSA. Uh, where I was the deputy CIO for the Federal Acquisition Service and had a number of other positions at GSA over my time here. Uh, so my uh, perspective on this panel might be a little bit unique um, because I was the buyer of cloud services like, like many of you are. And um, having spent uh, time in, in GSA, it was very cloud focused uh, when I was here. And, and I returned to USDA, I worked there twice. Um, we were beginning to adopt cloud in a lot of ways as well. Uh, the, the last uh, job that I had at USDA was as the deputy uh, senior procurement executive. So I've worked in the procurement field uh, deeply too. So I have um, a lot of experience buying cloud now on the industry side. And I had been in the industry before, but it was much more management consulting and you know, sort of pre-cloud, but a lot of looking at RFPs and, 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 and such. I think now we, we see that uh, cloud is much more of an expectation um, as part of a solicitation and uh, in, in that it almost has become, uh, I don't want to say dumbed down because it's still very complicated, but it's like, oh, of course we're going to use the cloud. Well, it's so much more complicated uh, than that and I think as, as Jay was saying, um, you know, cloud's not just one thing, it's a lot of things and as buyers, uh, we need to be really thoughtful about the questions that are asked of uh, of vendors in you know pre-solicitation and you know and, and questions that come up during uh, source selection panels and other things, because it's uh, it's much more complicated I think than I don't know if something just you know broke there with the that's not your cue to okay. cut it off you uh, <laughs> uh, you've got an additional much, three seconds because it's just much more complicated and I'm hopeful that during this conversation today we can highlight some of those areas that make cloud hard to buy where it's not clear why um, you know, a certain solution works a certain way, or how something is priced, or how prices might escalate over time, or what are the drivers of that price. As, as uh, buyers, I think you're, you're really uh, required to know those things, and, and, the, and the folks that you're supporting in programs in IT need to know those too, because it gives you a great opportunity to control cost and have uh, longer term buying power. So those are some things that I, I'd like to talk about as we have our conversation this morning. It's great to be here, and thank you for the opportunity. Great, thanks. And Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon Silverstein from Cloudera Government Solutions. I've been supporting the government for about 20 years. So as I look at this cloud transformation and digital transformation, I think back of when I started and I think of anyone remember Y2K? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's similar. It's a fear and uncertainty of what's going to happen in the future with data and what your environment's going to look like. And what it's even going to look like, you know, 10 years from now as, as, the, as the technology advancement between now and 20 years ago is astonishing. The data that has aggregated um, in your agencies over the last 20 years, some people taking it off of the manila folder and, and the, <laughs> yeah, with the, with the um, rims of color-coded highlighting, which is where you knew how to file things. That's how long I've been supporting government. But um, so the, you know, what, what it is though is 
this whole evolution of how to transform to the cloud, what's best for your organization, is it is a scary factor. Some of these data centers are closing and everybody's thinking, oh, we have to get right into the, the cloud. How are we gonna go do it? Or let's just go put everything in. Um, and I think, you know, Susie made a good point earlier is don't put everything in. Make, take this time, make good decisions on what needs to go in, what's gonna make your agency more efficient and effective in the coming years. And as the technology changes, how are you gonna suffice, how are you gonna remain consistent with technology and, and the adaption rate that your agency has to evolve to? Great, thank you. So the title of our panel is your agency is moving to the cloud and then there's more of it. So we're sort of starting from the perspective of the decision's been made, but uh, often at times I think the drivers for moving to the cloud are different and, and based on what those drivers are, the type of solicitation or, or exactly what's being sought uh, can vary a lot. Um, so I wanted to have uh, each of our panelists then, and we'll start, Shannon, with you since I think, uh, oh, you already handed off the microphone, but <laughs> I was gonna say, because you had the microphone. Um, and, and specifically, so what have you seen as the primary drivers for adoption of cloud um, from the agencies that you're working with? And then, accordingly, how easy does that make it to move into the cloud? Well, and, and I, by the way, my the company I work for is Cloudera. It is, is not a cloud company. Um, we got that name over, over back 10 years ago when we started. We're an open source platform, data platform. And so we're about the data. So I bring a little bit of a different perspective to this panel where we are about the data. What do you want to do with the data? Um, and, and that's the things you have to be thinking about across your organization is what data, what do you want the data to do when it's in the cloud? It's a lot easier for um, when people say, you know, the biggest thing I've seen, I support the law enforcement portfolio, uh, DHS and DOJ, you know, that they're being told their data centers are closing and, you know, I have some organizations who can't put all their data in the cloud and what does that look like? So you have to assess your data, assess the legalities of the data, the PII, the, the personal, um, information that goes along with the data and what do you want to take to the cloud with you um, and oftentimes it's going to be as we talked a lot about it earlier is it's going to be a hybrid environment and so then how do you centrally manage that so I think the the push to the cloud is a good one the technology will help adapt and evolve over time I think um, I think don't be scared by it um, but also you need to do an assessment of your data. Don't bring everything to the cloud that is on your existing, you know, in your existing infrastructure today, um, from tools and technologies to the data assets that you have. You, you need to make sure that you're bringing the right things to the cloud when you go. And just because the data center's closing doesn't mean that you have to, you know, run scared and put it all into the cloud as quick as you can to, to check the box off. So just think through the strategy. That's a great point. Checking the box is usually not the right answer. And so, uh, Jonathan, yeah, I wonder, do you I, I just want to build on uh, to... some of uh, Shannon's points because I think they were good. Um, you know, I think what uh, Shannon you're describing is a uh, strategy for data management, right? You know, managing your data, which you need to do whether you sit in an on-premise data center or you're in the cloud, you need to know where your data is. We heard that on the last panel uh, several times. And once you understand what your data is, you have a much better um, foundation from which to build a migration plan to the cloud, right? And whether it's PII or it's just data rot, data that's redundant, obsolete, or trivial, you don't need to necessarily take all the copies of that uh, old or dark data to, to a cloud environment. That's really gonna drive up your cost. You know, cloud is priced um, sort of as you use it, and it sounds, well, that's great. I'm only going to pay for what I use. Well, oftentimes we use a lot more storage than we think we use. Oftentimes we have a lot more data flowing um, over, over the lines than we think we do because we don't understand what data we have in our environments. So, um, you know, the title of the panel is you've decided to move to the cloud. You know, I, I take, not take issue with the title, but I think everyone's made some investment in the cloud at this point. You know, I think that we're sort of overcome that. It's now that you're, you know, we're embracing this in the government as a foundational technology. 
Um, how do we use it in the best way possible? How do we use it in the most cost-effective way possible? And you're all our buyers of this, so that's really um, something that I think you'd all care about. Um, as the users within your agencies, programs, and, and IT organizations, uh, they care too because you know they want to fund innovation and modern other modernization activities. And when infrastructure, and I think we think of cloud as uh, infrastructure-related costs, as those costs. Um, you know, maybe don't necessarily go down or they don't go down as much because we're using it in a way that's not as cost effective because we have too much data that we've moved that we haven't, um, you know, we haven't uh, taken the necessary upfront work because we're in such a rush to um, create a good understanding about what data we need to operate our organizations on. Um, those things really end up costing a lot more. I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of customers, and we were doing this when I worked at USDA, as we think about moving to Office 365 or other cloud email solutions, um, really understanding how much data you're going to migrate from your existing email system to another, or from file shares to uh, SharePoint or some other kind of online storage. Just really important. It, it, the these, the uh, expectation is, well, it's unlimited storage. Well, it might be unlimited storage, but um, that's what you have access to. But it's not that that unlimited storage is free. Storage costs money. Uh, everyone's going to charge you for it. It's going to be based on how much you use. So use what you need and not more than that as you make this journey. I think, you know, Shannon, you made some really good points. Jay? Yes. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Shannon. Um, I would like to take a different angle of how we interpret this from a strategy perspective as uh, over the past 18 months working with Mario, the CIO and the leadership at SBA, um, give me an insight more how the challenges of procurements are. There's a, a bridge between procurement officers, you know, contracting officers, the CIOs and the deputy CIO and the CTO try and actually translate that into a procurement. And a lot of times as I, instead of f working on the terminologies, the data and everything else, I'm trying to actually um, simplify it. Uh, by doing the simplification is basically saying, what are we trying to buy? At the end of the day, cloud is not such thing that you just go to the store and say, oh, I want a cloud, uh, I bought the cloud. It is about the drivers behind that. And the drivers, a lot of times, it's not clear. Um, you know, modernization, that's a very ambiguous terms, very broad in, in the essence. You can put a lot of things in it, and it's not something that just says, well, I'm just going to go modernization acquisition. Um, so I'll take the, the analogy of uh, everybody knows when you move into a house, you actually, there's a kitchen. You, it's anticipated to actually have a working kitchen. You need water, electricity, you need an oven. And um, before you start any meals, you need a working kitchen. Obviously, there's a, a cook involved in that. Is uh, for you to uh, do a meal, you got to have stuff that you got to cook with. Whether it is you you buying the groceries, whether you buying the meats and dairy and everything else, those are is what I call on on-prem solutions. You have to create a meal. You got to have all of these things placed before you can actually have an actual meal depending who you're serving. If you're just doing a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you got yourself a meal. But reality gets more complex. As the complexities in that on-prem data center, and this is the kitchen, a lot of ingredients gets washed, and you're trying to come up with the right solutions or the right procurement, and you're struggling with it. And so if, especially if you've got multi-different kitchens in a house, a large house, you have to actually keep different data center, the upstairs kitchen, the lower stairs kitchen, and trying to make sure you get enough groceries and cooks and everything else. The complexities from the big uh, contracting officers, it becomes complex. And to simplify it is basically, you know, we understand how to buy hardware. We understand how to actually buy software. It's something that you can just get on and procure it. You can compete it. It's easily to compete that. Uh, if you're trying to buy, in this case, like email as a service, um, obviously, EGS is Schedule 7, he has a cloud service provider, um, uh, a SIN that you can actually purchase on that. But there's more to it than that. So what you, if we're trying to actually purchase, in this case, hardware and software to go into our data center, it's easy. We just want to make sure it's there. Yeah, however, if you put in a lot of groceries in, this, in the freezer and never get to it for six months and you're trying to take it out, after a while, it's stale. I don't know if you want to be able to use that. So you need actually something that keeps fresh. 
and you keep buying more stuff. And you don't just only buy it for one meal for the day. You buy it and you store it. And you don't, a lot of times you don't end up not using it. So infrastructure as a service is if you actually go to a buffet, like in Las Vegas, when you actually have all kinds of things that's already prepared for you. This is your marketplace that you purchase. So you, you want to be able to create a meal for your kid or you want to be able to get a steak. Everything's there for you. How you buy it becomes basically a choice. It depends on the meal that you're trying to actually serve and who you're serving it to. So infrastructure as a service is that buffet. You, what, you're going to pay for what you consume. At the end of the day, when you walk away from that infrastructure as a service, you don't take anything back except your data in this case. Having cross-cloud capabilities, you, you, sometimes you want to try the buffet here, sometimes you want a, a different uh, buffet. So, and that's the contracting officer challenge. It says, uh, if I buy into like Amazon or if I buy into Azure or Salesforce, how am I going to commit the money across all these things? Do I have to compete that for every single activity and then call that for the drivers of it? In, the, in this case, the modernization or trying to get consoli data, consoli data center consolidations or the migration, all of that becomes a driver and how you compete that among these things becomes the challenge. So it goes back into the education. The, the CIOs, the technologists having to be able to work with the contracting officers how to put the proper strategy for the acquisition. Sometimes you can start at a zero dollars for implementing the cloud. In this case, the infrastructure as a service. And then once your strategy is, becomes more formed, more realized, you're going to build on it. And then your acquisition will grow. And the relationship between the, the technologist and the contracting officers and the CIO and, the, and the, um, in this case, the industry helping putting these strategies together will take shape. Um, if you try and put millions of dollars on a contract, says I'm just going to buy like an infrastructure as a service today, you don't know what you're going to consume, what kind of stuff you're going to go into it, you know, how many meals are you going to prepare this for, and who's going to be serving it, the, because you're paying this as a utility. If you don't consume it, a the data is not necessarily going to go away. The other folks are going to come in and purchase that. So. It's what you serve your end customer. It's about education, about the drivers between the industry, between the CIO, the decision makers, the, the management team, and the contracting officer. And that's a challenge of doing any kind of acquisition, regardless of what you call it from a cloud perspective. Great. Now, um, the food analogy may have made folks a little bit hungry. I think there's a break after this that's a couple <laughs> minutes, so you can run and get your snack then. Um, I, I just wanted to throw out, before we move on to the next prepared question, if folks do have questions that they would like to submit, please submit them uh, online, um, or else we can take questions in the room. Uh, at this point, uh, we actually, I think, have covered all the questions that we can answer um, that have been submitted online. And, and so uh, if you submitted a question for panel one and you'd like it to be addressed in panel two, please go ahead and resubmit. Um, I, I wanted to tie into what Jay had just said, because he started talking about how cloud, cloud acquisitions are sort of hard, I think, for industry to, to respond to because of the variation in, in just the range of services that can be offered. Jonathan, I was wondering if you could touch specifically on um, what types of information need to be articulated by the government during the acquisition process to really help us uh, understand and, and for the government to specify the right type of cloud offering, the right type of cloud computing environment, and the other uh, illities that may need to go along with that. Sure, thank you. So, um, you know, I like to think about uh, the concept of a performance work statement, right? You know, and what are you trying to accomplish? A statement of objectives, right? You know, what we're trying to do at this agency is X. Um, saying that we need a cloud solution, you know, I think jumps uh, a little bit to a. Uh, a way of accomplishing what you want to do. And my experience is that industry has some great ideas and experiences that you don't always have within your agency or your office. And you're better off asking um, for their great ideas. You know, by beginning with the idea that our agency needs to accomplish a thing, how should we do it? So um, I look at it as industry's opportunity to suggest the right kind of cloud solutions. I recognize it's not always that simple, and sometimes the acquisition is for a particular kind of cloud service, or it's for a um, software as a service that you know is you know also cloud. Maybe even, maybe even platform as a service where you're buying 
uh, infrastructure plus operating systems and other kinds of things. And uh, you can't be as, um, you know, as open to, to, you know, industry suggestions about how to solve a problem. But that's where I'd start, you know, in the best case scenario. I think when, uh, when it's a little more defined and prescriptive, I think some of the questions that, um, you know, industry, you know, wants to understand is, uh, revolves around data, right? You know, what are responsibilities around data? What are uh, requirements for protecting data, levels of security? Uh, from a government perspective, I think, that goes back to what we talked about before, really understanding what kind of data you have in your agency or, or within a particular application. How is that data used? Is it shared amongst other environments? Is it shared between clouds? Um, and from an agency perspective, I'd always uh, suggest that the, uh, or a buyer perspective, that you have um, some forethought about how you're gonna get your data out of the cloud. Right, cloud is often uh, very easy to get your data in, hard to get your data out. And I think that there have been some procurements across government uh, over the pr past few years where that became a real issue and agencies had to either back out of approaches or you know, cancel projects because they didn't maintain ownership of their data. And you know, own having clear ownership rights of the data and privacy uh, requirements around the data, really very important. Um, also, you know, to the extent that um, you're going to select a cloud provider today, it's not that different than selecting another set of technologies, you know, yesterday. Uh, they work for you now, but they might not always work. There might be a better solution for your requirements because your requirements will change and there'll be new providers on the market. So you want to figure out or you want to be thinking about how do I move my data between these cloud environments over time or maybe even bring the data, you know, back into your office because something changes and that's what's important. So having a clear understanding about what you need the data to do um, on day, what you need relative to the data on day one, and then understanding what might occur over the future, right? And you know, from a procurement, the what ifs sometimes become hard, but you have to think about them because that those options and that flexibility is important, not just on the uh, government side, but on the industry side too. Industry needs to be considering uh, the fact that, because industry wants to serve the government, you know, very well for a long period of time, you have to be thinking about uh, flexibilities that can be um, conceptualized into into a into a solution. So, just in summary, I'd say um, thinking about you know understanding the data requirements that you have, who owns it, where it needs to be, what are you know acceptable uses of it, privacy requirements. As as the government, what do you do when you want to move your data to another environment, and uh, how do you protect that data? Right, you know um, that data protection is is very important, and it may or may not come. Uh, at the uh, in the way that you need it in your in your particular cloud uh, solution, and you know going back to the very beginning of really very clearly articulating to industry what are you trying to accomplish, and if you can be very clear about that, I think you have a good foundation for a, for a strong procurement and good service from industry. Great, uh, Shannon or Jay, anything to add? Um, and you may want to take a while because we do have some questions that are starting to come in from online, and they are hard. So. <laughs> Anything, Dad? Yeah. So. Um, well, to second what Jonathan was saying is actually um, the data is, is a very important one, but securing the data is, yes, second. But there's a lot more to it from a cloud, just the data, um, especially when you, we're challenged at uh, trying to actually run an organization or run a whole agency. And there's a lot of pieces that needs to come together, not just the data elements of it, you, you know, maintaining the mission, uh, you know, availability, you know, responsiveness, mobility, you know, and then also drivers, you know, the newer technology that you're trying to actually implement to, to improve the, uh, the collaboration of your team, to try and actually have cross communications. If you're talking about citizen engagement in this case, you're talking about uh, cross agencies uh, uh, relationship technology needs to be there you know in this case are, are we trying to actually standardize on a specific cloud or are we cross cloud when you bring data into the cloud a lot of the CSPs they actually ch they don't charge you for it. it when you're trying to get data out of the cloud there's the ingress and egress cost so sometimes you know you, you, where your data resides it can actually reside across cloud in this case, whether it is in the past, SAS or IS. And that's a challenge that we're actually trying to address within the SBA because we've got multi-cloud multi capabilities and we says, okay, if we can actually move the data and have the data actually being uh, almost instantaneous having access between all these cloud providers, 
and try and minimize the cost. Cost has is a, is a become a, a challenge for the procurement and contracting officers. Because when they commit money at the be beginning of their period of performance and it gets consumed, they have to go back and yet add more money. It's a consumption model. So managing that, it's a, it is a partnership between the contracting officers and the management, as well back at the, uh, the industry itself. Uh, you gotta look at it from our perspective is what's the strategy, what's the driver behind it, and yet can we sustain it? You know, keeping the lights on when nobody's there that's, that's a waste, that's not efficiencies. You know, how do you actually make the cloud to be more effect effective to what you need to do? You know, Dev, DevOps, for example, DevSecOps, that, that is not running 24 seven. And there's no developers actually around the clock will be actually doing that. A lot of unessential, non-essential core infrastructure needs to also take in consideration. Sometimes you gotta figure out if it is an infrastructure or a PaaS or a SaaS, you know, what's the model, what's the, Contracting officers' challenges trying to keep up with all the all the spin and how the spin is actually across cloud. Right now, you have to actually compete every single one. So there's not a, a say. I'm just going to purchase one one cloud credit, for example, that's going to go toward across clouds. So that is not actually available today for the contracting officer to be able to utilize. So we actually worked with the GSA to come up with some kind of a solutions to allow you to make that happen. So those are challenges that the contracting officers will be faced with, and we've gone through these and trying to simplify it and actually have some kind of a strategy for it. I just want to add, add one thing to that. Uh, there are some good points there. And from a buying perspective and understanding what you're buying, um, it's very important that we uh, start you know, that you're working with your, your IT organizations who are all now working with uh, OMB and I think GSA around technology business management, TBM. And TBM is this uh, approach to you know, understanding uh, IT costs. It's used throughout industry. We're adopting it in government. And when you're purchasing uh, cloud or any other service, well, what kinds of requirements do you need to put in the solicitation? So um, the data about what things cost and how those costs are driven by different uh, capabilities or requirements, how do those translate into the TBM cost columns, the cost categories that we're all trying to track and manage to. So um, not that cloud's gonna be vastly different than maybe another telecommunication service that you're buying, but I believe that there may be some language or uh, requirements on the vendor that you need to be considering as, as you begin to, or continue to procure cloud. I think there might be a question out there. Let's see. I, we'll let Shannon, uh, did you have something you wanted to add before oh, I, I shift just to audience Just one last questions? thing I, I would say before, you know, specifying the right cloud, um, type of cloud environment you need is to really get your security people involved in this decision as well because there is a lot of risk around, you know, data if it's going into a commercial cloud or if it's going to a, a private data center, um, all of these have to be addressed and getting them at, at engaged early is a good idea. Um, and then defining where your gov uh, data governance, your audit and lineage is gonna, gonna fall. Is that gonna be with the cloud provider or is it gonna remain with your agency? So again, really good things to think about as you decide what cloud is right for you or what environment's gonna be right for you in the future. Great points. Um, I, I know we had one hand that went up here in the auditorium, and uh, I wanted to cover one of the questions that came in online before we do that. I'm going to put a little bit of a different twist on it since, uh, um, Jay, you already touched on it, I think. And the question is, how can cloud service providers and authorized resellers ensure that cloud usage does not exceed available funding on existing contracts? And the reason I, I wanted to go back to that is you, you sort of alluded to it, Jay, but at the end of the day, that's one that, that is one of the challenges when it comes to the model. So well, anything to add? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I actually personally get involved in this because um, it, at the early stages, um, cloud spend wasn't as, as much because we not, the consumption wasn't, wasn't there. As we increase the demand, and uh, this is a daily exercise. It's not something that you just leave it and forget it. The, um, the assumptions that you know, your cloud assumption, uh, at least consumption and a specific workload, uh, you expect it to be at a certain price, but then you figure out later that you no, know, it's a combination of multiple things. So it's working with the vendor, with the CSPs, and then working with the contracting officer says, okay, I think we need to go back and make an adjustment to the invoice because 
this something at the beginning didn't match versus what we actually seen. Versus, so it's, it is a daily exercise because otherwise you will make an assumption that your cloud spent a certain dollar amount, and then you find out, wait, wait a minute, you overspent. And overspent because of simple change that actually happened or being deployed that wasn't taken into consideration and wasn't completely spelled out. So having that as, uh, under control is very, very key. And it's, it's not something that you just completely ignore or what we've been doing. And previously, we just buy the hardware and the software and just leave it on the shelf or use it. So it's, it is an assumption that if you don't pay attention to it, you're going to be over budget. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say, again, those are questions that you all need to be asking as buyers. You know, how does the vendor uh, monitor that and how are you alerted um, to, to usage or spikes or overages? Um, because I, I know from firsthand experience that uh, overages occur, right? They just happen because we don't understand exactly how we're using some of these technologies at times or the, the users of them don't understand the cost drivers of, of the technologies. So um, overages are going to happen. I think the question is, what can the vendor do to prevent it? And that's a question you have to ask. And uh, Or how can they alert you when you've reached a certain threshold so you can make adjustments? The, and this happened to me on the government side um, in multiple agencies. Uh, you get a bill from a vendor with an unexpected dollar amount that you have to pay because you use the service. And suddenly it impacts your plans across uh, the enterprise to do other things. And that's the last thing you want as an operator of IT, a CIO or, you know, um, you know program manager, when you suddenly you cannot uh, add programmatic capabilities, functionalities, and drive the mission because you have a, uh, an unexpected infrastructure cost that through better communication and planning could have been controllable. It, it's, it's, really, it's really a bad situation. And unfortunately, it happens, but I do believe it's preventable. The, the one thing I would add, I'll switch to being a panelist for a second, is you know we're, we're often used to dealing in quarterly reporting, monthly reporting. Well, if we're expecting technology to be moving at the pace of something that is an order of magnitude faster than that, then you know the idea of monthly reporting when it comes to invoices and expenditures isn't necessarily one that fits consumption-based models. And so I think the points, Jonathan and Jay, that you brought up really sort of fit that as well, that there's a time frame uh, aspect for us to consider. Um, Shannon, did you have anything to add before I shift to a, a, a go back before I shift to a question in the audience? Well, one more thing to actually add to this is that um, there's ways around it if you actually develop the strategy to be able to remedy some of these changes. So, so it won't necessarily impact overages, but it allows you to lessons learned to prevent mm -hmm. future overages. Now, this is always a risk with live questions, so you got to make it an easy one. But I did see a hand shoot up over there. And uh, do you have a microphone? Yes, I do. Perfect. Hi, I'm very new to cloud technology. So the questions I have for you is what systems, can you give examples of what systems are not appropriate for the cloud or the type of work that would not be appropriate? And then based on that, how do you know which cloud is appropriate to buy? And then the last point I would like for you to address is can you give a best practice example of a very clearly written solicitation for cloud technology? Three great ones there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me take the first one. Maybe we could split it up that way. Um, so what's not appropriate for cloud? So I think uh, this was covered a little bit in the last panel, but there, there are uh, legacy applications in all of our environments. And I take, kind of take issue with the term legacy a little bit because, you know, as soon as you put a system in production, it's kind of legacy, right? So no one's ever been able to give me a clear definition of what legacy is. But the fact of the matter is there are, there are systems all across our environments that were built over a number of years and um, they work, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't still be in our environments. They might not be uh, the latest and greatest technologies, but you know, they work. Oftentimes, uh, there's a, an assumption that they could run uh, in a more modern technology or in a cloud for less money. I would challenge that assumption um, just because it, things are never as cut and dry or simple as that. And especially some older uh, applications, they, we might say that they are, quote, unquote, not cloud ready. And by that, we mean they're architected in a way that doesn't take advantage of some of the scaling capabilities of cloud or they have um, you know, challenges uh, sending data between systems or, or moving data in ways and, and sometimes doing it in ways that can be very expensive. So uh, a system that might not be uh, cloud ready would be one that is, um, you know, not a good candidate. And 
how do you assess cloud ready? I think that there are definitely checklists that are out there. You look at US Digital Service or 18F kinds of organizations and say, you know, what are the attributes of a cloud, of a system that's cloud ready? Or, um, you know, there might be some systems that have uh, uh, data requirements that, you know, don't necessarily fit in the cloud because of either national security or um, their FISMA high systems or other kinds of things. And, and we don't want to take that risk yet. Um, although some organizations are, and sometimes there are things like a private cloud where, you know, um, that the DOD and the Intel community, they're, they're using cloud uh, for these kinds of systems, but they did it with a lot of uh, forethought and planning inside those organizations. It's not a commercial cloud technology. So I'd, I'd look at the age of the system because that might be an indicator, right, and what are the foundational technologies that that system was built on, and what are the data uh, requirements, privacy requirements, security requirements around the data, things like that as starting points for wondering whether or not a system is a good candidate for the cloud. Uh, a choice between um, government cloud, commercial cloud, sometimes actually will come up on a regular basis. Uh, identifying basically the risks and, uh, and the, the adoption of that particular environment. Even in the DoD, not everything is actually supposed to be a government or high cloud candidate. So depending on the workload, depending on the solutions, you can have multi-cloud capability where you actually have commercial and a government cloud and have that properly segregated. So you can choose whether you want to, uh, you know, a specific environment that is purely in the interest of the mission and the risk. So you assess it if it's going to require like a FIDRAM high versus a FIDRAM moderate or even commercial cloud capability. The, uh, the other aspect that you're going to take a look at is the capabilities. A lot of times if the application takes the full capabilities like we're trying to do with the chatbots or we're trying to do with the machine learning capability, a lot of these capabilities and features are not necessarily yet available or to be available later on down from a specific cloud provider in the high environment. So we chose specifically working with the, um, the, uh, a lot of the engineers, a lot of the, uh, the management leadership in the case for SVA to move an environment from the high environment, cloud environment infrastructure, and actually push, push it down to the actual commercial cloud. And that is a federal moderate. And a lot of the workloads within the SVA was specifically tailored to the moderate environment. So at some point, we actually had both the, the high as well as the moderate environment running. And, and sometimes uh, we take the risk in a lot of the applications in the platforms to utilize Yammer. That is not necessarily a FedRAM uh, environment, but accepting that risk becomes the responsibility for the leadership and the CIO to assume. And um, as Maria always says, as long as she, well, she says that she doesn't look good in orange uh, jumpsuits, so we're trying to keep out of that. <laughs> so how to acquire that, it would be depend it's a, a management team between really the leadership and having the synergies between the, uh, um, the industry, between the cloud provider, the procurement officers, the management, and the CIO to be able to actually make those decisions and moving forward on this. Um, and I think cost is a driver a lot of times. You know, having put a workload in the high environment, it's very costly versus the moderate and the consumption of it. And then there are some workloads completely is not going to fit in any of these environments, especially if it's an older legacy, like in um, Solaris environments, you know, or to be, uh, or to be able to specific a workload that just doesn't have a fit, uh, fit within the cloud, so it stays on on-prem. And this is when you start becoming actually more of a hybrid between multi-cloud as well as an on-prem solution. So I've got another hard one that came in online. Um, and, uh, it, and we've touched on cost savings a, a little bit. Uh, the question specifically is around the idea that with um, you know, a relatively small number of cloud service providers out there, there's a pretty um, developed ecosystem of resellers and, and uh, managed services partners and others that uh, are essentially brokering those cloud services. The question had to do with economies of scale and how can an agency think about having both competition um, across numerous providers, uh, knowing that there's a relatively small number of cloud service providers, um, but at the same time, get those economies of scale. So they're trying to both split up acquisitions and then at the same time, 
um, realize the economies of scale. So I, I realize that might be a, a very tough question to answer, but I think there's a corollary to it as well that I was hoping we could touch on, which is, so what's the best approach? Is it better for the agency to consolidate by when it comes to the infrastructure and maybe separate out some other services? Or try to keep the acquisition of those cloud services pegged to a given application or, or something along those lines. Any, any yeah. thoughts from the panel there? Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll offer in the beginning that the idea of uh, an organization doing everything together sounds great, but it's very hard to accomplish, especially in a large federated agency. And um, you know the, um, eight, but all agencies are different. Some are some are uh, centralized already, even if they're large. Some are uh, smaller, but have a lot of pockets of of buying. And you know to buy all at once and to buy in an enterprise way. Uh, requires change management. It requires uh, the hearts and minds of uh, the people that are, um, you know, uh, making those procurements and running the different IT organizations across a very large, complicated organization to to want to do it. So um, you can get there, and I think you can you can buy a large agency, a DHS or a HHS kind of organization could conceptually buy all together. But you need all these very large and complicated organizations within those large complicated complicated organizations to want to do that. So if you have the environment that supports people coming together, I'd say, yeah, go for it and, and see how you can come up with corporate solutions. But if you look at recently in the DOD and the JEDI procurement and the idea of moving to a single uh, provider, which was the plan, you know, that met a lot of resistance at different levels of government and, and industry. So it's easily said it's hard to do, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try hard things and at least contemplate how we can make them work in our environment, but change management is really important. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I would say that um, a couple of things to think about, too, is that when you go to, I don't think any organization that's large in, in capacity would agree all in to one, one way or another. I mean, that's just the reality and the, the nature of, of you know, the organizations and the, the policies and the politics that go around around that. I think that um, it's important to have options, um, and there are options out there. I mean, you, you have your public commercial cloud providers, you've got your, um, you, you can do an on-prem cloud, you know, an on-prem on cloud solution um, that might it's just going to depend on what is going to fit within your organization, your specific um, needs, um, and be able to address them. And I don't know if you know all all or all in one is going to ever be an option. But I think that's why we talk a lot about multi-cloud environments and hybrid environments because I think that's the reality of all the data assets that we have and all the applications that we're running and all the legacy applications that are running. You know, you don't want to just put that all in one. Uh, the challenge, I mean, for having multi-cloud uh, procurement is uh, as strategies change, in this case, if you put all your eggs in one basket, let's say whether it's a Amazon or a, a Microsoft or Salesforce, moving, you know, the speed of, you know, uh, dynamic decision-making is very difficult because uh, then you put yourself back when we do a procurement that's hardware or software. So uh, we're trying to be agnostics in this case because I'm, I'm trying to actually help the mission. So I'm trying to figure out, okay, what makes sense? Do we have a single bucket of money that we can actually spread a across these cloud providers? What is the, how easy it is to actually move funding between those particular cloud providers? It's, um, from our challenge, it's very difficult. Once it's, the money is actually committed to a period of performance in a specific cloud, uh, with the procurement challenges, it's very difficult moving that money between uh, one provider and the next. Mm -hmm. And so there's a consumption model. You know, so actually, it's a utility. At the end of the day, some of it is actually challenged that y y you run out of the period of performance and you still got money left on the contract. And a lot of times, that period of performance ends and all that committed money goes away. So, and the fact if you do licensing, in this case, if it's a SaaS solutions, and so you have to actually commit, and as a strategy and adoptions takes a while. So if you start with 3,000 users for a specific SaaS environment seats, then you end up having to have only five or 10 users consume that. 
that's money left on the table for the government that can never get it back. So, I mean, GSA from a procurement schedule, GSA has the um, Schedule 70 or the CSP CLIN 132-40, uh, allows you to be able to procure these cloud service providers. One of the things is say, what's the best way to procure that? and allow for the multi-cloud spin, and ability to move funding between cloud is a key for this to succeed. Otherwise, you're gonna end up really committing a lot of money in a single provider, and you have no way to move that, especially if your strategy changed, and the decisions to actually shift between cloud becomes a key. So if you, if you find out that uh, a workload is better in, in an Amazon cloud versus Azure cloud, you can't switch that workload. You're pretty much committed to it. You know, um, the fact of the matter is that, you know, cloud is somebody else's data center effectively, right? Um, it's going to go down. All clouds go down. And, uh, you know, Amazon ha has gone down in the past and Microsoft has gone down in the past and Salesforce has gone down. These are outages because it's technology. It's just like outages in your agency today. Maybe they're less frequent, but they're outages. I think Amazon, AWS is like 99.9% .9 uptime or something like that, if I, if I recall. I mean, that's about 72 hours of programmed in downtime per year, right? Don't quote me on that. That's not necessarily what they say, but it's, it works out to something like that. And it's just a reality of technology. Things break. So, you know, there's a concept, you know, business continuity is an important concept in all of our environments presently. And business continuity in the age of multi-cloud in some ways is, is actually a little bit easier if you have uh, technologies uh, that you procure with your you know, cloud initiatives that allow you to fail over to another, another cloud environment or run in a multi-cloud environment as, as Jay's describing. Um, because you'll have an outage and when that outage happens, um, you know, AWS or another provider, Microsoft or Google, whoever it is, you know, their, their um, service level agreement is around uh, getting their infrastructure as a service back up in a timely manner, and they're very good at that. But if you read the fine print, often you're responsible for your data, you're responsible for your systems, you're responsible for the security of those systems. Uh, that's not on the, it's not on the provider per se. And the, um, the reality is when something goes down, if it's not a well-architected application or there are a lot of dependencies, uh, sometimes it can be very hard to bring that application back up. Sometimes data could get corrupted. Uh, so you need data protection when you're, when, you're, when you're in the cloud. You need business continuity when you're in the cloud. The same requirements that you have today in your agencies when you operate IT and that you need to buy when you're buying uh, technology uh, apply with your buying data center services effectively, cloud services, compute services uh, in the cloud from, from, uh, from another vendor. They're not going to do all those things for you. Um, it might feel like they're doing some things for you because that's the way it, it sounds or it's sold, but you know, that's where you got to really read the fine print and ask a, ask a lot of questions in, in, in my opinion. Thanks, Jonathan. I think we have one question if someone's been shooting their hand up in the audience for a bit, so let's try to get that one in. We've got only a couple more minutes left. Go right ahead. Thank you. I think uh, Shannon mentioned that uh, we have to move uh, uh, the right things uh, to the cloud, and uh, I would like to know uh, the specific uh, examples of uh, the right things and how these uh, right things are secured in the cloud environment. So the, the question, it sounds like, is specific to cloud security for specific documents that may be moving into a, uh, a public cloud environment? Is that and how they are uh, um, secured in the cloud environment. Yeah, so those are going to have to be you know, open discussions with the cloud provider that you're, you're um, talking to. And again, goes back to the open communication as what are you looking for as an organization um, and, and again, to have those security uh, staff, your security officers in the room that actually are going to help you to ATO and all of those things along the way is the sooner you get them involved, my point was that, you know, the, the happier everyone will be um, and the, the checks and balances will be there um, as you go down that path. Um, from a security perspective, right, you, you have to figure out, again, it's going to have to be an open conversation with um, the, the service provider that, that you're talking to is how are they securing your data, who has the key, who owns the key management aspect of that, are you, are you supposed to be in control of that, and some of the, you know, some of the organizations have very sensitive data, and they want to, you know, obviously hold on to the, the key management structure um, so they can 
own it uh, and not have the commercial cloud vendor own that um, aspect of it. Um, and then the, the security around audit and lineage, um, who's accessing the data, when um, you need to figure out how you're going to implement that and, and how you're going to do that. And when it's not in your data center in, anymore, it's in a commercial cloud. So we're about out of time. I wanted to just uh, have a real quick lightning round, if we can. So this, no, no pressure, you know, maybe 15 words or less. We'll see how we do. In terms of uh, just what final thoughts do you want to leave with our uh, attendees today in terms of how to uh, make a lot more agile and sort of future-proof acquisitions so that 10 years from now, we're not thinking about the challenges backwards looking that we had 10 years ago when it comes to uh, how solicitations looked and, and how to sort of future-proof those requirements. Anyone want to tackle that one? I would get um, all your I would get all your components together um, and and start to define uh, your future future goals as an organization and what that might look like. How much data consumption is going to be in the future based on historical numbers? Data, I mean, the sensor information coming in from all over the place is is going to be crippling um, in the next five years. So account for that. Account for if you, a cloud service provider starts to raise the rates on you and you can no longer afford that, how are you going to move and transform, transition your data over to something else? So just be cautious of, you know, again, where you're going to um, put your data assets, how your data assets are going to grow. Uh, and and how your p personnel, how are they going to be able to access this data in the future? Mobile devices, I mean, everything that, what are, you, are they going to be w remote work from home or in, in the office? And how are they going to access this data? And, and is that all going to make, make sense with the future roadmap? So map it out. Don't go into this um, quickly or hastily. Just make sure you define all of these requirements and, and set the stage. I knew lightning round wouldn't be easy. <laughs> yeah, that was light, lightning and thunder, then a little more lightning. That's right. was, uh, but uh, real, real quick, cloud, uh, everything Shannon said, plus cloud is a very important tool in your toolbox. Uh, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, all these things have the opportunity to change the way organizations buy technology. And uh, we're effectively outsourcing a lot more things than we used to do. You know, we did internally. So one day, long in the future, it's all going to be about the data Shannon was just talking about. And um, most technology will, uh, infrastructure kinds of things and applications even through, you know, the sales forces and Microsoft's and others will, will be in the cloud largely. And you, uh, as leaders in your agencies, need to have uh, strong control over your data, understand it, be able to use it, know where it is, know how to move it around, pull it back when you need it, move it across multiple clouds, because when it comes time to use that data to achieve great outcomes in your agency, it doesn't matter where it is. The people that want it, want it when they want it, where they want it, how they want it, and it's up to you uh, to enable your IT organizations through acquisitions to be able to have tools to move that data around, own it, and have mastery over it. That, that's the long-term uh, thinking, long-term strategy that I think will achieve success across uh, not just government and not just federal government, but, but across IT. I'll keep it very fast. Agile, uh, Agile acquisition is a key. It's a terminology that will be here. And uh, a lot of the contracting officers out there are trying to figure out how to do Agile acquisition. And um, I would say start with GSA schedule. I think there's a, a good opportunity for you to lead leverage. Um, but uh, situational awareness, agile acquisition. Great. Thank you. So thank you to all of our outstanding panelists and for the great questions that came in online. I'll turn it back over to John. <laughs> to provide instructions for a very quick break, I believe. Panel again, thank you so very much, and you again, our audience. Now we will actually take a formal break, but it will be extremely brief. I think we'll get back together at about 11.35 Eastern Daylight Time in the auditorium and virtually. We'll see you real quick.
So they're going to come in through here. And if you want, you can move the laptop if that's easier. So the questions from remote attendees, okay. we're going to copy and paste them here. Okay. Um, and then obviously people who are in person can ask questions. So. Because we've done our, our PC set up here for the question. Okay, okay. so who's I'm looking gonna, at the I'm questions? I'm going to, Set? I will give you a nod. Thank you. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for returning. I really do appreciate that. Next, we have a case study on public sector, the public sector point of view on implementing cloud strategies and cloud adoption in the public sector. So we're going to experience the process walking through the end-to-end -end implementation cycle, identifying project gaps, and managing the metrics and return on investment. And if you would welcome, please, the individual leading this very intimate conversation is Jay Hajir, President and CEO of Practical Solutions. Hello again. Um, Thank you for uh, inviting us here to uh, present. This is, was a last minute. I was actually asked um, about three o'clock yesterday to actually step in and, and do this use case. Uh, the intent initially was to present the use case of the commercial and the government and our experience through the whole journey to the cloud. Uh, opted to actually instead just focus on the government implementation of the cloud. And I have invited um, Ms. Maria Vogt, the CIO for Small Business Administrations, to actually join. And we'll have this candid discussion. So what I touched on earlier is that um, the teaming partnership between the industry and the government, or in this case, any organizational management leadership, to have the cloud migration to be very successful. So hopefully you get to enjoy this. And we'll have, have it more of an interactive. So we'll take some questions. We'll actually feed in. And um, so you get to actually see the um, how things actually work, how it should work in properly to be able to have a successful adoption to the cloud. So next, please. So uh, our last 18 months of engagement has been to actually help the U.S. Small Business Administration. As you know, Small Business Administration is focused on addressing, their whole mission is about addressing the small business uh, uh, owners and entrepreneurs of trying to make sure there is, uh, in this case, free competitive advantage and actually supporting the small business as most businesses, they grow from small to large and help them through that journey. And um, had the pleasure actually um, supporting Ms. Maria Vogt in previous engagement. We do a lot of uh, turnaround strategy for FISMA uh, back in EOCIS. And um, we'll, you know, 
uh, she's a very known figure in this case. So she's been <laughs> talking to a lot of a lot of different stages. So it's been a great uh, use case to actually present for you, uh, Ms. Mary Vout. Uh, she had many different titles in the past. <laughs> and, uh, she had thirty plus years of experience in the technology. So she, she's been a CIO. Oh, she is a CIO now, and she's been a CTO. I she, was. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and and you know she's been uh, chief of staff. She's been FedRAM director at, here at GSA, so she's been a very instrumental to make sure that our cloud journey is very successful. So uh, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, uh, and th at this particular time, I actually. Uh, before we dive in in how the cloud journey began, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Ms. Mary Rote to a, introduce yourself further or to be able to just lead us into this use case of the cloud journey. All right, good morning. Um, I want to walk you through a little bit of what I walked into at SBA in October of 2016. There had been a lot of turnover in CIOs before I got there. Um, so on Monday morning when I reported, the weekend before I got there, there was water coming in the data center. Not a lot. Any water coming in a data center is not good. Um, that was the weekend before I arrived. There had been a big storm here in D.C. and there was construction on the roof and long story, but there was water coming in. Bad in a data center. My very first weekend there, um, uh, the air handlers went out in the data center. Um, so welcome aboard to SBA. Um, throughout that week, I got nothing but complaints and service and all of those kind of things. So uh, immediately, I uh, jumped in with both feet trying to figure out what's going on. Um, not only that, I had workforce. I was down about 30% in workforce. So uh, my immediate staff in the CIO's office, I had a lot of vacancies going on, including key leadership positions. Did not have a CTO, uh, a deputy CIO. Uh, director of operations, getting ready to hire. I had a CISO that was brand new from industry that had only been there for two months. So um, workforce gaps, um, uh, walking into an environment. Uh, long story short, I was there about two weeks and I asked what was running on the network because somebody was in my office and they screamed at me. Um, welcome aboard SBA. I had somebody literally come in my office and holler at me about how bad the network was, how bad connectivity was. I asked the team, I said, what is running on our network? Give me network utilization and what are the top five things running on our network? They could not tell me. This was our network operations center. Nobody could tell me what was really running on our network. Um, in our data center, I asked for an inventory of what's in our data center. I got four different inventories. Um, I asked what was running in the SBA environment. SBA is very stovepipe, very separate. Because of the turnover in the CIOs, a lot of the program offices had done many of their own things. And just by virtue of getting things done, I can't necessarily blame them. But walking into an environment like that and not knowing what's what's running, um, I got my arms around the contracts. Um, this is when you know Jay started working with us. Um, to stabilize the data center, understand what was in it. So that was one of the very first things. The pictures that are up here, I actually, I think about my third weekend or so, I came in early one morning with a camera and I walked through our primary data center and took a whole pile of pictures, printed them out, put them up on a wall. You'll see it up there with before. Um, and that's where we started back in, uh, back in the fall of 2016. There were three things I told the team by mid-November. So about six weeks in, I said, one, we're going to four racks in our data center. Two, we're moving our entire network and our entire infrastructure, which was, I didn't say this was more than 30% completely saturated and not architected correctly. And then three, getting our entire environment moved to Windows 10 and Office 16. Those were the three things I said were our goals and that's where we were headed. Now mind you, I still had to take care of workforce and get a deputy hired and those kind of things. But um, with Jay's assistant, we took on getting our arms around the data center and stabilizing that. Mm -hmm. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, can you touch on the uh, cloud funding before we dive Oh, in? the cloud funding. I had no funding to go to cloud. So when I said we're going to four racks in our data center, I don't think my team understood what that meant. I knew what that meant. I'd been working in this space for a while. I knew exactly what that meant. My team did not know what that meant. 
I don't think anybody outside of my team, whether it was acquisitions or HR or anything like that, really understood what it took to get to four racks in a data center. I did that with no funding. I ate out of my budget. I looked as part of the assessment that we did when people, I looked at every rec that came through for funding. Why, if I'm gonna shut down a data center, am I gonna buy UPS batteries? Why am I gonna spend money? I had 38 different security tools. Why do I have all those tools? Why am I doing that? Um, looking at how we're spending, when those requisitions came in for hardware for CDM phase one, I said I am not spending more than $300,000 on hardware for CDM. We have a cloud environment as part of our enterprise um, licensing, part of our enterprise agreement. We have a cloud footprint. Why don't we just use it? We're the first agency to put CDM in the cloud. We did it because I refused to pay for the hardware. I did not have the money. With the cuts that I did, for the software, not buying any hardware, I told the team as well, Jay's familiar with this, no new hardware in the data center. I drew a hard line, and that's how we got to CDM in the cloud. And the money that we cut from all of that, I reinvested into that architecture and engineering services. That's how I self-funded. By having the successes throughout into FY17, I proved with the team, not me, the team proved with the deputy I hired CTO, with our partnership with our contractors, we showed number of successes and we were able to reinvest those dollars. So I did not go to the CFO for another penny. All right, thank you, Maria. So this is the stage I moved into, I actually walked in. Um, uh, next slide, please. So reality would take on, would take on a challenge just like this, as easy as uh, basically it's a day-to-day -day operations. You know, strategy and vision of the CIO drives the uh, the mindset. Where are we going? Where are we headed? So, I'm going to use this. So, in reality, you don't see all the uh, so some of the challenges. There are some text on this on these slides. Um, so. October, and we, when we actually walked in into the data center, the very first things from a strategy perspective is trying to get a handle. A lot of you heard earlier that there's an inventory that you have to know what you got. Since we didn't have an inventory, so we didn't have an actually uh, a way to be able to figure out exactly where our assets is within the data center. First thing that we took on is to actually do the um, uh, stabilizing very immediately. There's a lot of the infrastructure that was within the HQ data center. Um, a lot of them were turned on, but it's not being used. So a lot of them taking yeah, electricity, they are consuming a lot of, uh, you know, obviously HVAC was a key when it was shut down. So we worked trying to, first thing is when we walked in is do that technology gap assessment. Yes. Can I say how we did that? Yes. We used, for those of you in the acquisition workforce, we used, we applied agile methodologies to our data center, getting our data center stabilized. This is what Jay isn't saying, that we had daily stand-ups with the meetings, we turned up JIRA in the cloud, we were using that to track everything, and it was a big, hard push. Um, we had a culture change that we needed to, to take on to address it. Yeah. So we applied agile methodologies, we had series of sprints, all of those things, daily stand-ups, to get to stabilizing the data center and getting that inventory. So this is before we actually had the target team. The initial objectives was to actually show value, show stabilization, to show from an agile perspective. When your stuff is actually are being turned off, when the electricity is shut down, when things are actually falling apart, is you got to address it right away. And that's, that was an initial task. And we didn't take months trying to do this. We took literally you know, a couple of weeks to be able to get to that stage. The next is a consolidation. Uh, consolidation, basically there are a lot of environments in multiple different racks that needs to actually be in a single rack. A lot of the stuff that's actually tagged that, you know, for, that is being utilized or not utilized. We've got some servers that there used to be 2003 servers that were you know, completely uh, out of our warranty. So we had to do a very effective key uh, accomplishment right away to make sure that we have a, sta a stability within the data center, consolidation, and then the forming of the uh, Tiger team. Uh, the objectives is to actually get to the four racks so as a main driver for us to get to the cloud. Um, so, you know, if we had hundreds of different racks uh, within the data center trying to get to the four, it's going to require strategy. It's not something that's going to overnight. 
So um, the first thing is to actually get the whole management team on board. And between the time that um, Maria had um, to basically hire the federal staff, the CTO, the um, deputy CIO, and we try and actually get everybody on in in the same room in the in the same looking at the same view to make the right decision. So we formed um, the Tiger team that is a mix between the federal staff and, and our staff and trying to make every single decision trying to get to the cloud. So the period, what you're not seeing here is, this is before February um, 2017. So between October and February, we had to con stabilize, consolidate, and to form the team and then jump to the cloud. So I think our start for forming the team, it was about February, the first week of February in 2017. So to get from February to May, literally 82 days to make sure that we stand up an environment within the cloud environment. And that has gone from zero to basically having an ATO within a cloud environment. So uh, that meant the Azure methodology is the key. You know, we have to make agile decisions and to be on the spot making these decisions. And it cannot be just an individual. We have to actually be empowered from both the, um, the contractor as well as the federal staff to actually work together in making these decisions. So initially, it's about education, educating everybody on board. So um, Maria knew about the, the cloud and its capability of the cloud. The rest of the federal team didn't. Till she hired this, uh, the deputy CIO, a guy Kavala, to actually help. You know, this pretty much was an impossible task to be able to consider going to the cloud. We uh, colo environment, and we decided against that because we've got to get to the cloud and we've got to get to four racks. So we initially educating the team on cloud is basically took a lot of relationship with the cloud service provider and our team as well as the federal team to be able to get, educate about the infrastructure as a service, trying to identify the, the platform and what things that actually be helpful to stand up the cloud. So um, let's move on to the next slide, please. So the team that was actually formed um, uh, with the executive sponsor at the time it was Guy Gavala, who is actually is the executive sponsor. And in it, you can actually see the CTO, um, uh, Sanjay Gupta, as well as myself and the team to be able to really manage multiple scrum uh, teams to be able to focus on a lot of the things that we didn't know, but we know that we need to have at least a starting template, so the team structure. Uh, the service management, the uh, engineering team, the automation team, we even a migration team, as well as the, um, the operations team. Those were all involved in the decision making. Uh, um, embedded among all these teams is actually security. Security is not a team by itself. It's actually, it's the objectives for going to the cloud is has to you know, address security at every step of the way to, in order to be able to get to an ATO within 82 days. So it was a very key having those partnership across the teams as well as security is actually involved in it. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the initial concept for the cloud. Made it very generic, very, you know, uh, structure perspective. We borrowed a lot of uh, previous um, work that um, Guy has actually done at TSA in the past. So we borrowed a lot of these concepts to actually put in place. This here on paper is just, you know, this is more, almost a, a napkin drawing of what the cloud in the network infrastructure is going to look like. Uh, we didn't know a whole lot, but we kind of said, let's get a stab at it. And this is at least will be the initial architecture. Having an enterprise or cloud architecture, it isn't something that we started with having a full detail of it. So based on that, we actually worked with, uh, in case Microsoft and the Azure team in the Microsoft in training centers to be able to educate the whole team and, and really get the connections to the cloud. Um, we had connectivities in the AT&T MPLS network as a way to connect to the cloud. So we worked with AT&T. We thought that connectivity to the cloud is going to take months and months to do it. 
It was actually a lot easier, a lot easier than that. It only took probably a couple of weeks trying to get connected with the express route. This is the multiple ways you can connect to the cloud, but we wanted to actually have a fast internet connections between us and the cloud. Because as we migrate to the cloud, we need connectivity. We need a high-speed connectivity to do it. So we stood up the connectivity. We were able actually to extend our, you know, our environment to the cloud and, and include that as part of the, um, the whole ATO package. You like to add anything to it? On a roll. <laughs> so, yes. The, um, the next slide is actually the, the complexity. It's hopefully the, no, of course not. <laughs> well, in this is we actually have a lot of these is the milestones of activities that we are actually able to accomplish. And in this case, this is a technology where if we're using PowerPoints, this probably would actually show better. Um, so within the 82 days, that block that we took and trying to initiate a lot of these activities. I'll, since I have a, a copy of it, I'll, I'll try and actually rattle off some of the capabilities that we've got and then open uh, the floor for a lot of the questions. Migrating to the cloud is not about just you know, hang a sign, open the road, and just be in the cloud. Um, a lot of the things that we were talking about earlier, stabilization and consolidation, but we also ran into transformation at the same time. One of the program offices uh, for the disaster, if you want to touch on that a little bit, that they needed to actually have an environment. They didn't want to, you know, we were on a short time span trying to stand something on BizTalk, at the same time, we're trying to do all this capability of, you know, of getting into the cloud. So not just only that we do an initial in, in, um, initiation or at least the establishment of the cloud, but also trying to move a lot of the workload where it makes sense from a platform perspective and to be able to deploy new technologies to be able to modernize some of the, the program office's needs. So. I was going to say that rationalization is really, really important because one of the things that I, I also said was that we are not going to do a lift and shift. That was not an option um, for anything that we've got in our data center. We had to, like Jay said, we had to modernize, get everything up to current levels, uh, make sure it's taking advantage of the cloud. You know, what made sense? Software as a service, PaaS, and doing, really thinking outside the box to do things differently. Why are we continuing to build something when there might be a SaaS tool? So we really had to take a hard look at that. So, I mean, a lot of it is just trying to do it on a budget. Remember, she had a zero dollar uh, to start this cloud migration. So, with the initial setup for the cloud, at least uh, for the cloud commit within the infrastructure as a service, it started out on a credit card. I kid you not, we've actually made this credit card, the $2,500 limit on a credit card last for the 82 days. Because we had to prove, you know, right from the get-go that it's actually doable, that we can actually get that proof of concept out of the way. And uh, till we figure out what we need from this environment, we didn't know all that we needed to actually stand up this environment. So one says, okay, all right, procurement is a challenge. I think <laughs> many of you want to touch on the whole procurement during the um, uh, early 2017. We, we didn't have the CSR in place. Yeah, uh, we we had to, you know, through our contracts, you know, we had to figure out what we had. You know, one of the things that I looked at was all of our contracts and figure out how could I do this with, with you know, the staff and the, the enterprise licenses and the cloud environments and what capabilities we had. We already had, you know, the Microsoft Enterprise License Agreement and that had a CLIN on there for cloud. That was good. But we also had to be creative like, Jay said, how do I get the money to put some money on it to start spinning up the cloud environment? Keep in mind, SBA also had, you know, a footprint in AWS as well as um, Salesforce and some other things. So predominantly for this exercise, you know, for this effort um, is on the, on the Microsoft piece. So, you know, one of the hard things to do even as we've moved through to today is that you're, you're buying cloud services as you use it, think commodity, think like how you pay for your electricity. We, we're not putting all this money up front. We're, we're buying things in small chunks and that's very hard for acquisition people to say that I'm only putting on a small amount of money at a time, once a quarter, once a month. So that was that's definitely a shift that we had to work through. I, I mean, shift is being light. <laughs> Understatement. <laughs> Understatement. 
Uh, a lot of it is the challenges. The challenges mainly it's not necessarily technical. A lot of it is, is really, it's about uh, resources, a lot of uh, getting everybody at the same level of communication. Uh, I mean, we face with those challenges on a daily basis. How do we get everybody buy in as a team, not just only at the leadership team, but as also at the whole staff? It is, it's a give and take a lot of times. Sometimes you actually have to work trying to educate. Remember the analogy that I took earlier, basically, you, you expect it to actually have a kitchen and that kitchen is about putting meals out. You always got to feed it. In this case, knowledge is fed uh, to the staff, you know, basically, whether it's contractor or government staff, it's a constant knowing exactly it is a transformation, but reality, it's a whole lot of things all piled up into the, the same activity. You can't really just procure it at the beginning because you don't know what you're going to face. Sometimes you make some decisions, you make some changes from a workload perspective, it will have an impact that you haven't seen because, A, we don't have an enterprise architecture documented of the whole infrastructure because it didn't exist. And we had to actually, you know, do this by trial. A lot of times it's about feeding and keep feeding that knowledge and working with every single person that says, okay, this is not how it's done. This is not how we've done it before. Now we're going to have to do a mind shift, a training. Workforce training is a key in this. And it's not just a one day, go to class and, and, and be done with it, you become an expert. It's a constant feed. And a lot of these changes, when it is on on-prem, it's going to be completely different when we move it to the cloud infrastructure, especially if you're trying to choose between PaaS, SaaS, and IaaS. Those are, will have a different challenges altogether. The other aspect of it is security. We touch on security a little bit, but reality, security is a main key. You know, a lot of times, you know, you think if you put it in the cloud, in a secure cloud environment, it's all going to be secure. There's a lot of other pieces that you have to take in consideration. And that, that's, to me, it's a constant feed from the strategy all the way down to the implementation. You can't just put a strategy once and forget about it or just visit that in about a couple of months. Because the speed of the, the, the capabilities of what is actually being released in these cloud is fast. And sometimes it actually will, you need to take advantage of it to actually help you out. So the last thing I'm going to end up with is the last slide is about what I just mentioned. You got a lot of competing uh, efforts that needs to take in consideration when you go on the cloud. I consider actually doing strategy session, but it's a continuously making decisions, and you can't just make a decision at the time when you do a CCB. It's a constant change. You know, a constant change is going to require, say, you know, constant decision making, taking consideration. There's always risk. And um, she doesn't look good in orange jumpsuit. <laughs> so, and I, I'm going to stop here and actually take, a, you know, a lot of your questions. You know, you're going to run into a lot of these similar issues and not necessarily as complex or that uh, difficult as it is in other agencies because they may have the funding. And Maria, what is your funding for IT spend? Mine? Yeah. Uh, my budget's a rounding error <laughs> compared <laughs> to some of the big agencies. So even if I have 50K or 100K or something like that, that's big dollars for me. And guess what? I can do something with that. I'm pretty creative with when it comes to that and you know and frankly I really need um, uh, you know I want an acquisition community that's with me the contracting officers and others that are that are helping me that are that are creative just as well and just as innovative so that as we're pushing the envelope and really trying out new technologies and and really trying to move through the cloud and really trying to be agile and quick and fast I have to be responsive to my program offices um, you know, as new people come in and out, as the strategy, the vision of, of SBA and the things we need to do, I have to support that and I have to be responsive to that and I need an acquisition community that's just as, as creative and flexible and, and able to move things through as quickly as, as I would like to run. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take questions. Uh, Janelle, if you're going to, it's locked, <laughs> I can't see the questions. So if any questions in uh, in the auditorium, we'll take those questions. Um, hi, my name is Greg McTour. I'm from the um, National Credit Union Administration. Um, my question is for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about or speak to how 
um, given that aggressive timeline on the with, um, on, in which you um, went to the cloud, mm -hmm. can you talk about how you brought your FTEs or your existing CIOs, um, CIO staff along with you to that journey to the cloud? Because that seems like it would be an aggressive transformation of skills to some extent. Yeah, so, um, so for a bigger picture, you know, um, the first year, you know, October 2016 through till last fall was incredibly focused on a ton of behind the scenes things, upgrading the network, stabilizing the data center, laying out the cloud architecture, doing those kind of things. So a lot of that wasn't completely visible to the rest of the organization, but they knew services were getting better. So that's a good thing. But for the workforce piece of it, last summer we did a whole series of once a, once a week lunch and learns. We did lots of on the job training. Um, I have not turned down any requests for funding uh, for training to, at this point. Um, there has been some that have come in that I've, we've redirected people to, whether it's you know for Azure or cloud-based training, something like that. We've redirected it, but I've not turned down any training yet. But we're taking advantage of you know the lunch and learns because there's a lot of free training out there. And um, my deputy actually led this. He took a look at the courses, a lot of the free things that were out there, and we did that once once a week. We opened it up. We had a lunch and learn. People would bring their lunches. I would go to those. Um, uh, as much as I could, I did show up and attend and sit through those. Um, but that's how we we got to some of the training that you asked about. And a lot of it is on the job, and some of it is also we're not doing that anymore. We're doing this anymore, and I need you to learn this. Any more questions? <laughs> What's your cloud My cloud budget. budget? <laughs> My actual overall budget in my office is uh, certainly mm, probably about 26 million. It's much smaller. You, this is all publicly available. There's no secrets here. Um, my budget for cloud, um, probably what we're spending now um, on cloud and what we're burning, probably around a million, I think, um, or less. We're watching it. We've actually been doing a lot of tweaking this year as far as what we're burning, the number of VMs. We're actually questioning everything, uh, certainly with the with with Jay and my contract, we're monitoring the environments to say, well, well, why are we doing this? What do we need to throttle back on? Because where we see we're, you know, we had a big uptick in spend. So we're, we're active, we're not passively monitoring it, waiting, we're actively monitoring and managing the environment. So we have to, to be able to manage our spend. Um, and it's not just for Azure, it's for AWS, or it's, you know, in totality for environments. We have to watch what we're what we're doing, you know, and turn things off as it's not being used. That's the beauty of the cloud, you turn it off. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> good after good morning. My name is Mona Rayside. I'm from the United uh, States Department of Agriculture. So clearly there's a reason why people had started working around your CIA organization. You came in, you took care of the stuff behind the scenes, but at some point, the cloud has become a driver of the business. It's gonna change how people are operating. How are you overcoming the sort of resistance, you know, because there was a, a culture change that made people distrust CIO for a long time. How are you overcoming, how are you winning converts as the CIO moves from back office to really the driver of organization, the driver of missions in many cases? How are you changing minds now that it's no longer just something happening in the back room. Um, showing, show, actually showing um, success. So, you know, the first year we showed a number of successes moving to the cloud, backing up some of our systems initially to the cloud, then doing the migration, that stabilization. So those end users are seeing the results of it in a more stable environment. And, and having more capacity, more capability. You know, being able to show people that, you know, you don't need to buy these tools, we own these right now in teaching. So for the CIO staff that's outside of my office, some of it has been for the technology folks that are out there, you know, they're sitting back there and going, great, another CIO, there's been 12 in the last 15 years, great, we got another one, now what? So I've had to overcome a lot of those cultural things, which is some of what I think you might be getting to around that. We had to prove show some successes internally, then people start paying attention. Um, last, I will tell you that I have an awesome partnership with Tim Gribben, so shout out for Tim Gribben, uh, uh, who's our CFO. 
um, working with him on the finance piece. Anything that's over 50K, I have final approval and sign off on. Last fall, I sat through all of the budget reviews side by side with him for FY18, looking at all of the agency spend. That's a lot of work, but I sat there through every one of those. And you know what we did? We took all of those spreadsheets, dumped them in Power BI, and went every time I walked into a meeting with those program offices and the CFO, I put them up on the screen and said, this is what the tools can do for you. And we were able to use Power BI and show how the spend was, and not only for just that particular program or that office, but across the whole agency. So by showing, we were able to do that. And that includes you know, the CFO office and using that budget data and being able to show those things. So it's a matter of, of demonstrating, showing success, and a good partner, certainly, with, with my CFO. I think that we're almost out of time. Um, I think at the end of the day, partnership uh, internally at the federal staff as well as with a contractor and stemming from the strategy down to the uh, implementation is a key for success. And I guess I'm going to close with one thing. Uh, as we're working together as a team, I look at my CIO team as a team, whether they're feds or they're contractors. There are things that, that have broken as we have moved along this journey, things that have not worked. And I've made it very clear to my team that we are not pointing fingers because there are things that happened before even I got there that when we make a change over here, it impacts something over here. And they are, should be mutually exclusive and not happen. So as we're moving through this, we are trying new things and we are doing different things and I've made it very clear to the team that we are a team feds and contractors and we're working through this together and when Jay showed you the chart up there on the scrum teams that was a complete mix of my contractors and feds on on those teams so um, we're, we're trying to build that and we're not in the business of pointing fingers and telling people well you broke well no let's just move on and fix it because there's things that happened before I got there and there's things that are going to happen as you're trying new things don't point fingers learn from it and move on thank you Maria thank you for joining thank you thank you Maria J, fantastic, thank you so very much. Once again, let us do a quick set change and get ready for our la final panel. If they, everybody can come on down and get set, and I will do my best to introduce it. Our final panel, Chris Berman, I think, used to say rumbling, fumbling, and stumbling. No, we're hard charging, we're going towards that end. Uh, cloud management evolution and what's next is going to provide insight on what comes after the successful implementation, uh, cloud implementation. And our panel members are going to discuss the challenges to expect and, of course, the great practices for operating now in this new cloud environment. So this session is going to conclude with strategies and next steps to enhance the cloud adoption journey and a sneak peek woo, and at some up and coming technologies that are going to play an increasingly important role in the cloud evolution. So if you would, please welcome Moses Merchant, Senior Principal for Cloud Adoption Strategy at Agilius, to lead this august final panel. Thank you, John. Uh, you pretty much said everything I wanted to talk about over here, you know, in terms of introducing uh, the session. So. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the final session, uh, cloud management, cloud evolution, and what's next. Uh, so you've heard the previous panels take you through the uh, cloud journey, uh, starting with um, you know, the whole cloud strategy. What do you need to buy? How do you procure it? And how do you migrate your workloads? And again, what we are going to do is focus on what comes next? What happens when you actually implement your workloads in the cloud? Uh, how do you actually operate in the cloud? Uh, so uh, again, my name is Moses Merchant. I'm from Agilius. And we have a great panel over here for you uh, for this event, uh, starting with Vikas Sharma on my left. Uh, Vikas is the uh, Chief Solutions Architect at uh, Savatech. Uh, Vikas, 30 seconds. What's your favorite cloud acronym or buzzword? 
Uh, my favorite buzzword is transformational. And I'll explain it. Okay, well, I'm, okay, cool. Uh, next up over there on the far uh, right over there is uh, Adam Clater. And uh, Adam is the chief architect at the North America Public Sector Division of Red Hat. Yeah, thanks, right. thanks for having um, me. Your, your favorite uh, buzzword, your favorite cloud story? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, one of the things that I've heard is uh, when, you're, when your cloud bill gets to around $100,000, your cloud salesperson never stops calling you. But when it gets to a million dollars, they never call you back, right? And so it's, it's just the idea of how do, we put, um, how do we put the control back in the consumer of cloud, right, rather than having folks locked in. And I hope uh, we're going to talk a lot about that and how to make sure our workloads are portable and we're smart consumers of cloud as we enter into all this. Excellent. Finally, we have Dan Prieto. Uh, and Dan is the strategic executive from a small company called Google. Uh, they make uh, search engines. Uh, Dan, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? I had to Google this 11 what? meters per what? second. African swallow. 11.15 meters per second. Uh. Um, All right, your thank favorite you. story. I don't know if it's so much a story, but I think given the composition of much of the audience today, acquisition professionals, I think it's important to realize sort of the, the brave new world that we're entering. Um, the Federal Acquisition Register, the FAR, includes the word cloud exactly zero times. If you extend that search to the DFAR, the word cloud shows up six times. OMB A130, governing the strategic management of IT, uh, which was just updated in mid to late 2016, only includes the word cloud three times. So, and I, I, I was at the White House at the time on the National Security Council staff. I was at DOD prior to that, and I helped, uh, you know, push that document out. Times, they are a-changing, and that's really the focus of the conversation today. And it's not just about understanding tech. It's about understanding the impact on business and culture of that tech. So I think that's really going to be a lot of the focus of our talk today. All right. So... Uh Folks, we have some uh, really smart people on the stage over here, uh, barring myself. Uh, so then, without any further ado, let's uh, jump into the uh, discussion over here. Let's start with an important milestone. Uh, some of you have already crossed it. Uh, some of you are getting uh, over there very soon and making your way towards it. Um, and that's deploying your first application in the cloud. Right, so um, because let me start with you. You know, you've successfully deployed your first application. No one's complaining. So in your experience, what are the important things that one should be thinking about at this stage? What do you need to do at a strategic and operational level at this stage? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Uh, <clears throat> so first I'll start with uh, admitting it's a bit of a hypothetical question. Uh, because given the size and organizational structure of your agencies, there won't be one. Uh, there will be many. Two, three, one, program, one per program office or center or uh, service or business unit. So they'll all be going to the cloud. But this question, when the panel selected it, was intended to be a table setter for the conversation that follows. <clears throat> and uh, let me try start off that conversation. Um, what we want to do, we, it, folks do a lot of stuff uh, after they achieve, uh, so you just got your first system, an ATO, uh, production ATO, in your enterprise cloud environment, so a lot of stuff has already happened before you did that. But at this point, when your first ATO is granted, I would strongly urge people to use this first experience as a learning experiment. <clears throat> uh, 
and gather and leverage those lessons learned across the entire enterprise. Uh, how do we do that? We do an enterprise retrospective. Uh, you can get some Agile coaches, uh, acquire services or some Agile coaches to help you along with that activity, but at a minimum, your group of people who are engaged in this retrospective are your system developers uh, and owners, your mission folks, uh, IT operations and infrastructure, and absolutely acquisitions. Uh, there are some critical lines of inquiry here, okay, as to uh, what do we do next? So how was our experience? Okay, how long did it take? How many groups did it involve? Were there shortcomings in our system architecture and, and configurations that we had to overcome? Did the system meet performance requirements not only for itself but every upstream and downstream dependencies uh, that the system has? Was the process of deployment automated? If we keep to our current process, how many updates and deployments can we do, okay? Um, what changes do we need to make in our operations, okay, to, for this system? When do we know something happened to that system in, our, in production? What is our contingency plans, disaster recovery, RTO and RPO, recovery time objective and recovery point objective? <clears throat> how, long, how long did the ATO process take? Do we expect all following systems to follow the same process? Or are we gonna somehow change it? Uh, how do we update or do we need to update our enterprise threat model, okay? Because of this new reality of there being a cloud in our environment. Uh, what security events do we need to uh, now monitor and address, okay? And are you seeing the cost savings that you perhaps expected to see? Very important. And why and why not? Finally, we're trying to do this because we want to learn lessons to how to do this faster and cheaper. Okay. So that's a pretty significant list. And then and the question naturally arises, right? That why should we do this? Okay. Seems a long list, a lot of very complicated things. And for that, we have to kind of step back a bit and tell a little story, okay? Uh, well, after all, we've been running, you know, we've been developing systems and running infrastructures for decades now. Why do we have to suddenly, every, everything has to change? Okay, what's new? Okay, what happened? Okay, uh, so to, to answer that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's necessary to take a step back and kind of talk about a particular story. Uh, first of all, everybody knows, you know, cloud's the, cloud's the thing right now, okay? Everybody's doing it, everybody's going to the cloud. Cloud adoption, we had a little discussion up in the morning about cloud adoption. Cloud adoption rates are very nice, okay? To me, the question was why? What's, why are people going to the cloud? Okay, so we started looking and Obviously, what happened was we found out, you know, sure, capacity and elasticity, elasticity on demand and cost effectiveness was the top two reasons why people were moving to the cloud. But there were a whole bunch of other reasons, okay, and why they were moving. So, and then other thing that was caught my attention was certain leadership and in industry that understood the cloud platform to be that innovation, that transformational technology that allows them to change their organizations to finally transform their organizations into what they always wanted. What do you folks want is nothing different from what those guys want. Uh, more organizational responsiveness to the mission. More business agility, okay? And that the stories are no different out in industry or in government. It's, Everybody is really looking for that responsiveness in the organization and the business agility. And so that was a big reason for why they were, they finally recognized cloud as that enabling technology. Now, it, but w what is the cloud? Is something new? Okay, do we need to get uh, overwhelmed about it? For me as a, as a person who's been dealing with the cloud for a while, 
I know most of the base technologies within the cloud exist in your enterprise right now. Virtualization, containers, uh, all that stuff, disks, block storage, object storage, everything, every base technology that exists in the cloud exists in your enterprise right now. So what's new? Okay. Well, <clears throat> what the cloud really did was put that in a really smart new package. So if the internet gave us the global communication infrastructure, think of the cloud as giving you the global compute infrastructure to go along with it. And all of that, just you get to go to a website, present your credit card, and use every one of these great ideas in computing that we have put together in that package. That's new. Okay, how we deliver these compute services back to the end users, that's new. Okay, and what really this enabled was almost transformational. CEOs and leadership out in industry have completely revamped their business models. They have created entirely new business models, and they have brought about more than anything else the kind of transformation they were looking for. And so that's why you have to learn the lesson, because the package does those, uses the same base technologies in a slightly different way to enable cloud paradigms like uh, elasticity on demand and capacity on demand, um, time sharing for your cost effectiveness, and pay as you go. So it doesn't make much sense to, for anybody to go adopt what is, uh, yes, a new package, awesome package of old technology, and then go about doing the way, stuff the way we've been doing all along. Can't take your old infrastructures and your, the way you develop systems and all that stuff out. So, so that's why we have to learn the lessons. That's why we do enterprise retrospectives. We learn how to change all the processes from development to deployment to operations to security to uh, that's the first step that I should that I would recommend people, the organizations take. Thank you. Transformation, that's the key word over there, right? Because, uh, very good, very good. And, and uh, that was my buzzword, transformation. Transformation. And, and when you talk about transformation, I'm sure people have heard about building things faster, cheaper, better. You know, there's the old joke about pick two of the three. I think with the cloud, you can get all three, right? Faster, cheaper, better. Um, is there anything that's, uh, that's different when you move to the cloud, you know, from, from moving from a physical infrastructure or from like on-prem to the cloud? When you, again, if you've, you know, you've just finished your, your migration, you come in the next day, um, you know, are there, are there things which are going to be the same also? You know, we spoke about some differences. Are there things that are going to be the same? And, you know, is, is, does anybody else on the panel have any, any opinion about that? Thanks. So I, I think we need to take a little bit of a step back and just think about, you know, when we begin to talk about cloud, what, what aspect of cloud are we really talking about? So there's infrastructure as a service, which I think is really the classic design of, I have a virtual machine or a physical machine within my data center. I want someone else to take on the O&M for ping power and pipe, and I just want to move that out to someone else's data center. Uh, but there are other models that, that I think we're going to talk about later on, like platform as a service, function as a service, and finally, uh, software as a service. And I think by and large, the consumption characteristics I've seen throughout the federal government have been focused on the two extremes of that spectrum, right? How many folks in the room are using some sort of software as a service for their email? You've got O365 or a Gmail, right? And so that's, that for a lot of organizations, that was actually the first foray into the cloud. Uh, and now we're looking at some of these lift and shift type of models, right? I want to move out of my data center into someone else's data center. So I drop that O&M for ping power and pipe. I'm no longer in the, in the real estate business, which these are all really intelligent sort of decisions for a CIO to be making. Um, but many times that's kind of closely aligned to more of a managed services contract. 
right? If I haven't refactored my application to exist in that cloud, I, I'm really just entering into a managed services agreement with a cloud provider and then obligating myself to pay uh, you know, by the minute, by the hour for that service as I do that. So I think we need to carefully examine the cost benefits of, of making these decisions. Oftentimes that movement and that lift and shift is quite valuable. Uh, and so we do that uh, to stem some of that short term um, hemorrhaging of cash, right? And so, uh, but if it is more valuable, in fact, for us to enter into a traditional managed services agreement, I wouldn't necessarily be afraid of doing that. So I think you have to look at what level you're really looking to attack and what the goal of the organization actually is beyond moving to cloud, um, which I think has been a big driver. I, I want to pick up on that and also pick up on Vikas's uh, comments. You know, once you get your toe in the water on cloud, I think it's important not to focus on the technical aspects of it, but as some of the other panels before us have said, focus on sort of the business implications of it. Because if you ask that question, why am I doing this cloud project and what benefits is it having, it will tell you whether you are taking full advantage of what the cloud can offer or not. Um, Am I doing a cloud project simply to save costs? Perfectly valid reason. There's been a push for many years to sort of improve cost management in, in government, obviously. But that is sort of the most basic proposition of the cloud. You could go further and say, well, am I actually getting significant performance improvement? That is a more mature and strategic view. Uh, you could go further and say, is it transforming my approach to security? because I am now no longer responsible for what I've moved to the cloud for the patch management or the life cycle management, uh, and that's now up to the CSP. That is another consideration. And the final most strategic consideration is, is my cloud project and my view of how I'm going to use cloud, does it actually help me modernize? Does it actually help me innovate, right? And those are different value propositions from cloud. In my view, the big push to cloud that we are in right now actually has a very specific point in time impetus. I think the focus on cloud, in my view, from when I was at the White House, stems, to be frank, from the aftermath of the OPM breach. That is the first time that all of these formerly separate conversations, cost reduction, security, and modernization, those had been long trends, but they had tended to be treated separately. OPM brought all of those together, and OPM said, well, wait a minute, you can attack, you know, kill each of these birds with, with, with a stone, and that stone is either shared services or cloud. So the big push to say it's okay to outsource key functions around IT happened under the tail end of the Obama administration. We focused on shared services and cloud. This administration has actually picked up the ball and been pretty continuous and has shifted more and more to, to cloud on balance even more so than shared services. So once you dip your toe in the water, step back and say, how is this project setting us forth on a journey to take full advantage of what cloud can offer over time? Absolutely. So I spoke a little bit about sort of the ongoing O&M costs, uh, whether that be in your data center or whether that be uh, in a cloud environment. And so the reality is, you know, if, if as the CIO we decide to buy some technology and it costs us $100,000, but there's a million dollars on the back end of, of man hours and operational cost in uh, seeing that technology to fruition, that's a pretty significant cost overall. And so we need to make evaluations uh, about, you know, should we be buying this as a service rather than really trying to build this technology on our own or, or building this upon an infrastructure stack where we have to be responsible for all of that. 
management. And then I think Maria actually did a really nice job in the last session of illustrating the value of monitoring and having an understanding of all the things that you're deploying. So she said when she first got there, they couldn't tell her uh, what was on the network? What was the number, the top five consumers of network traffic? They couldn't even begin to put their finger on that. But now she has capability in her cloud environment to have that charge back and show back of resource utilization and say, oh, we need to turn this off. We need to turn the lights off uh, when we're done uh, building or using a particular workload because the potential for run up of those costs is, is quite dramatic. And so, um, what I would say is that yes, management and management tools are a critical component of being successful in the cloud. But I think the tenant that we have to really take with us is that it's automation of that management. If we have uh, human capital individuals uh, managing resources directly within our cloud environment, uh, it's an incredibly expensive way to do that, right? So if you have a human uh, deploying a server in a cloud and it takes them an hour to execute on that task and that's that would really be great right if one individual could do that in an hour that's a task that could be automated to happen within seconds or even minutes uh, and that's a fully secured implementation of that infrastructure so I really think that automation of a lot of these tasks the security evaluations the implementations the deployment of our technologies uh, as we look to move into cloud that's really the tool uh, that needs to be, in, in my opinion, um, one of the biggest parts of that. I think the good news is that learning the skills and the practices of automation are something that you can do sort of within your own data center, right? You can begin to automate within your existing infrastructure and really not make a huge uh, expenditure in the cloud in learning how to automate the cloud. Um, so. I, what, what I would say is that, you know, kind of use that as an opportunity to get your internal house in order and begin to automate those workloads internally and then automate their deployment to that cloud. Um, I believe that once we've executed on that automation into a cloud, we begin to figure out how we're going to automate ourselves out of that cloud. And so, you know, in the next generation of cloud consumption, the portability of workloads is going to become really important. Uh, if, in fact, we're able to capitalize on spot market opportunities within uh, the cloud marketplace, our ability to move those workloads between the clouds is going to be the only way that we can realize uh, those financial opportunities. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, the vendor community has been pretty adept at um, cloud enabling. I think we're, uh, we're getting much closer to actually cloud enabled tools than maybe we were a few years ago when I think the focus was really on cloud washing, right? Which was just, hey, look, we've added cloud to the name of this and now you can use it in the cloud and it's gonna help. Um, and so, uh, yes, I would say that many of the, there's a lot of maturity in the tool sets today, uh, but uh, there are also going to be new tools that you're going to seek out and that you're going to use. Uh, a lot of those tools are really going to be cloud native. You're not going to necessarily want to deploy a complex monitoring system into your cloud in order to get a lot of the information. You're going to use some sort of subscription uh, software as a service monitoring tool uh, and then consolidate that. But I think one of the rather daunting tasks of CIO is certainly going to be how do I integrate uh, the things that are in the cloud that I'm buying today with the technologies that are still within my data center. Uh, there was some discussion earlier today on what workloads are or are not appropriate for a cloud. And uh, for certain agencies, there are workloads that may not ever move to a cloud. I think those expectations are constantly evolving. So the workload we might not move today, we may be uh, looking to move a year, two, five uh, from now. But in the meantime, that integration of exposing the business value that is available in the cloud 
to whether that be our internal data or even our internal applications uh, is certainly one of the tasks that our CIOs are going to be responsible for moving forward. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, one uh, other concept that I keep hearing about when, you know, for cloud management, and that's uh, pets versus cattle, which to me is like very interesting. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? What does that mean, pets versus cattle? Yeah. Has anyone else heard that term? I apologize. Um, so the, the idea is that if we have a server in our data center, uh, it's really, really important, right? We know exactly what the workload is that's running on that server all the time. And in fact, we name these servers. They may have creative names. Uh, you know, when I started out at the Patent and Trademark Office 20, nearly 20 years ago, we named all of our servers after dead rock stars. Like, that was our server naming standard. And they were really our pets. And, and someone would say, hey, uh, Lennon just went down, and, you know, McCartney's not able to this or that. And, and so that was a real part of, of how we managed our infrastructure, and, and we knew the version of the operating system and the patch level, and we knew all these things about these servers. And they were, we really treated them like pets. But in the cloud environment, we don't do that. We don't do that at all. Uh, and the idea is that if you've got a herd of animals and, uh, and one gets sick, you don't necessarily take it to the vet to get it fixed, right? You may just cycle it out of your production system and you'll bring in another cow or mule or what have you uh, to sort of fulfill that spot. And so rather than sort of making that investment on an individual basis for each individual server and really taking care of them, um, you know, we, we really just have this idea that we can build a brand new server with this capability instantaneously in the cloud. And I think that really speaks to the automation story as well, is that as we automate that, we're able to guarantee consistency across all of those servers. So hopefully, without too much of the gore, I illustrated a bit. And I realize Paul McCartney's not dead. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's some debate on that. There has been. Um, some of you remember. But uh, he's not, not, not dead. He just released a new album, actually. Very good. Well, um, let's come back to uh, automation and uh, more specifically uh, DevOps. So who on the panel would like to define DevOps for me? Uh, so, DevOps. Uh, it's not a complicated definition in my mind. Uh, it's best defined as a culture of collaboration between your developers and your IT operations and all operations teams to deliver effectively on the mission. <clears throat> when do we start thinking about DevOps? Um, my, my suggestion is before you go to the cloud. Because if you're going to define DevOps in the name of collaboration between teams, I mean, who doesn't want that? Okay, right? So start thinking about it before you go to the cloud. Um, also, I today know, I do not know any way to do cloud effectively without Agile and DevOps. I can do cloud without those things, yes, just not effectively. So what does this, and what is automation in context of DevOps? So I tend to think of automation as the implementation, the, the of that before mentioned collaboration. I mean, you can ask the question, okay, so what kind of, uh, what form does this collaboration take? Do we talk a lot among each other? We already do that. No, we, we write automation software to um, automate stuff. We want to do a few things. We want to, in our DevOps uh, implementations, that in, we want to automate our software engineering uh, life cycle as much as possible to actually develop the systems. And we call those um, CICD pipelines. <coughs> and there was a continuous CICD stands for? Continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines. Okay, that's typically the, um, and all the code that goes and enables that automation to within it. The continuous integration pipeline is, is, is an integration engine that integrates all of your um, development processes, enables automated testing, 
and the continuous delivery pipeline, which lots of software for uh, is written by the ops folks, or traditionally worked with the ops folks, is about continuously delivering software to your environment. So when we operate in the cloud, we tend to think of delivering software not in three-month increments on whatever, and that, that big deployment and everybody stays up at night and all that stuff. No, we do it every day. We, our code goes from our development environment, goes through all the testing, passes all the security checks, and it's delivered to the cloud. We don't want um, big bang modernization efforts. I like to think of it, we are modernizing every day. Just a small bit, but yes, modernizing every day. Um, so what do we have to do to enable this? Okay, so I told you about the continuous integration pipelines, but when we write um, automation for deployments, what we are doing is we have to, let's look at the steps in the deployment process. We have to provision compute uh, your networks, your storages, uh, certain security th stuff on that, and enterprise services like logging and monitoring. And then of course there comes the, the part about updates and, and patch management, okay? You keep on putting patches on it. So we write code for it. We don't do it manually. So uh, it's, it's written in automation so that none of these instances that we are deploying, virtual machines that we are deploying, and applications we are deploying, we are handcrafting, lovingly handcrafting them, no. It, it's part of an automation pipeline that gets it done. That's the automation. And the goal in my mind of automation is to take our workforce from what is considered lower level activities to higher value activities in your operations. So I don't have to spend hours and hours taking a disk with me or whatever mechanism we had of updating my servers, I'd rather to be doing something else of a higher value. And I'd let my automation engine handle the updates and the configurations and the provisioning. So um, when we build that automation, developers, operations, infrastructure folks, security folks, why do we need this collaboration? Back in the day, somebody asked me, oh, why, why do you define it as collaboration? And what I did at that time, I, I was stumped, but I, I went and asked, give me your top five or seven concerns that you're managing. I went, asked that to the development team. I asked them from in operations, infrastructure, and security. The lists I got back from these diverse groups is completely orthogonally different. They are managing different concerns, and of course, that's why we had different groups. But now, since we have to enable this fast, continuous delivery of software into, they, we have to develop a mechanism to do this better, and automation is their answer. Okay, so that's my definition. I'll, I'll piggyback on that, and also introduce the concept of, of no ops or serverless. And this speaks to, again, what the cloud can enable. Um, basically, you know, Google and the other cloud providers as well are, incre are increasingly offering uh, cloud offerings where you really don't have to worry about the infrastructure or updating the infrastructure or writing code to automate patch management, lifecycle management, all of the above. That is all handled in the background by the cloud service provider. And that is particularly valuable for use cases like application development, working in databases um, uh, and analytics because it allows, for example, an app developer to just code and when they need more capacity, it automatically spins up and the environment has the tools to allow them to just focus on the coding. Um, similarly on analytics, a lot of cases, in our instances, a lot of automated machine learning, for example, allows automation of labeling of data so that you can just focus on what the data is telling you, for example, to improve a business process. The analytics folks, the application developers don't have to worry about all the things in the background. And, and in that case, neither do the operations IT people 
inside the enterprise. You have the opportunity to outsource that provisioning, that configuration, that patch management, that lifecycle management to um, the cloud service provider. And with that, actually, I want to pivot, because I know this is one of our questions. Are you okay if I pivot to security? Go ahead, yes. In those instances where you increasingly rely on the CSP for more of the functions, configuration, patch management, lifecycle management, there is an increasing opportunity with cloud providers to really figure out what your security model is. Do you take your old security model from your legacy environment and replicate that in the cloud environment. That is more likely to happen if you simply replicate your data center, you lift and shift it. I have the same number of servers, but I'm still responsible for managing all the security. There is more value add potentially in saying, you know what, I need to come up with a strategy where I rely increasingly on the CSP for security. Now, this is an interesting point because one of the largest impediments uh, to cloud migration continues to be concepts about is the cloud provider secure? In Google's example, I'll give you the following. We provide a public cloud. The cloud that you will be running on with Google is exactly the same global infrastructure that YouTube runs on, that Gmail runs on, that Search runs on. And so the question is, actually the proposition is that Google's interests are completely aligned with yours in terms of the network and cloud services being performant and available. Our ability to deliver a YouTube video and, you know, South America, any time of day, any time of night, in under a tenth of a second. Our global infrastructure provides that. You know, we discovered some of the biggest recent security flaws because we have security researchers in the last three years, you know, we've put $30 billion into our own infrastructure. In the last, in 2016, Amazon, Microsoft, and us combined put $30 billion into our infrastructure. So we're constantly investing. So that relieves the burden of investing from you. And it relieves a lot of the sort of blocking and tackling security functions. Yes, I know my patches aren't updated, but I haven't got around to it, so I'll be okay with an unpatched system for about six months. The benefit of relying on the CSP is that they are constantly upgrading the infrastructure and the patches and, and updating um, the environment. Similarly, OMBA 130 requires strong identity, multi-factor authentication, at rest and in transit, uh, encryption. Um, there is a long history of challenged projects in government of trying to implement, implement multi-factor uh, authentication, trying to implement encryption in-house. You're now in an environment where you don't have to run those kinds of projects because what you move to the cloud is natively encrypted. What you move to the cloud automatically has patch management. So really, I go back again to the FAR, Section 7 of the FAR says that when you write acquisition proposals, you have to think about the benefits to government of what you are acquiring. The role of the acquisition community is as a full and equal player in an environment with the CIO, with the CFO, with the secretary. You guys play an equal role in enterprise risk management. And if you think about that as your mission, not as learning about all the technology of cloud, but what role can the acquisition community play in enterprise risk management. What can I do to inject more innovation? What can I do to buy down or obsolete technology that is expensive to maintain and hard to secure? When you think about risk management, don't just think about risk management of the acquisition process. Think about risk management to the enterprise, the agency, the department that you are part of, and how using acquisition and procurement to get cloud services can improve your risk management posture. That's the right way to think about um, the role of acquisition in here because it is a multi-stakeholder sport. Everyone has the same objectives. You can no longer put IT and business in silos or acquisition and IT in silos. You're all part of trying to buy down expensive and hard to secure legacy environments and move it to something that is more nimble, more agile, more cost effective and more secure. How do uh, FedRAMP uh, guidelines play a role? So, uh, play, play a role in the yeah. So, uh, the FedRAMP guidelines were obviously established with a view to making the process of um, thinking about security around cloud providers more agile and more efficient. 
the FedRAMP office over time has made a lot of improvements. I mean, there's still things it can do to improve, but I think the important thing to do is to look at the FedRAMP requirements. On the one hand, it's a compliance regime. On the other hand, it does provide actual security. But from the, for the acquisition community, I would say this. Get familiar with the FedRAMP um, controls. Understand what they are trying to achieve from a security perspective. I think I've seen instances where acquisition professionals sort of put on the contract dozens, scores, hundreds of pages of additional security appendices. That isn't necessary. I think you have to build up a level of knowledge and trust about what FedRAMP brings you from a security perspective. Um, try not to bring a bunch of additional requirements on top of it because that basically defeats the, the time to market, time to efficiency benefits of cloud. Um, and also think about, if you are going to bring anything agency specific, is it really achieving something from a security perspective? We've seen this in a number of cloud RFPs lately where they're over and above FedRAMP, there are additional location specific requirements. Think that through. Just because something is located in the United States doesn't necessarily mean it buys you more security. It buys you security in an old version of sort of physical space and physical borders, but that's an outdated view of security. If you have strong multi-factor authentication, if you have a zero trust network, like the network that Google provides, if you have strong encryption, the guidance in many cases actually is if your data is encrypted and somebody didn't steal the keys and you lose the data, you didn't actually have a breach. So in that situation, ask yourself, what does location specific requirement buy me or am I really have an outmoded view of security? Um, where I can increasingly rely, rely on the CSP for the security or rely on encryption or rely on strong ad identity and not just rely on traditional perimeter views of security. Excellent, thanks. Uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, agencies uh, that are further along in their cloud journey. Um, and uh, Adam, question for you. Should agencies institute a cloud center of excellence? Uh, to focus on things like governance, uh, standardization, ongoing training, education programs. It is. It appears this one's on. All right. Thank you. Um, so establishing a cloud center of excellence, absolutely. I mean, I think there's no reason not to. I think. The guidance that I would give is that we should start small, we should start with an application that's far away from our data, uh, something where we can iterate quickly and really learn what these things really mean to consume cloud, to implement DevOps, what an ATO looks like, what the security process really is. Uh, because I think every organization, every application, every cloud implementation is going to be incredibly different. And I think that um, there's just a ton that uh, can be learned by going through the process, uh, whether you take a OODA type of approach or, or what have you. There's, there's a variety of ways that you can execute on something, observe, make some decisions, and then reiterate through your activity. So, so yes, yes to all of those things. Um, you know, I think the other the other thing that I would think about, especially from an acquisition perspective, uh, is try to buy as many large components of this as you have, uh, as are available in the marketplace, right? So, you know, if we think about the postal service, they have a pretty unique uh, mission, right? They are really responsible for that last mile of delivery. And they have some pretty unique things that they do in order to do that. There are post offices in every small town, and they have these really funky but iconic right-hand drive vehicles that are all over the place delivering mail. And those are pretty unique, at least in the North America marketplace to the post office. Not a lot of folks out there are buying a vehicle that they can't take through a drive through for example. Um, but the post office made an interesting decision. They had a unique requirement. They are a government agency. They needed something that really wasn't available in the marketplace otherwise. And they did not go into automotive manufacturing. And I find that astounding because I think a lot of IT organizations within the government today are in a very similar state. They have some unique requirements. They have some security standards. They are the government. 
and they're in many ways going into the process of manufacturing technology, but instead the Postal Service found that uh, they could buy this in the marketplace. They might need some specialized, and they are iconic. We all are aware of these right-hand drive vehicles there in our society, and they're really the only ones that are using them, but rather than build a manufacturing facility for them, they were able to buy that from industry. And so I think we need to, to be very critical about the way that we go about these acquisitions, that we don't need to build our own technology over and over and over again, because I think ultimately what happens is it makes a lot of sense sometimes for a single agency to do that. It, there are really some very specific uh, environmental requirements where you need to build your own technology. But what we're seeing is in the aggregate across all of government, when this begins to happen, I think it becomes a bit of waste. Um, not in the capital W, I'm gonna call somebody an alert, an IG, but in the, hey, is that a really good effort? Are we wasting effort? And, and as we talk about DevOps, DevOps is about delivering frequency, frequently and the elimination of waste. That's really uh, where the Kaizen part of DevOps comes in to this lean capability. So I would just say think critically about that. Should we be building technology or should we be buying technology? A130 would also argue that you should buy. On that, on that last point, the OMB A130 revision in 2016 is very clear on that front. When you are making IT investments or doing n new IT projects, you need to thoroughly determine whether the same capability is out there commercially. And if it is, exactly to your point with Postal, you should not be out there trying to build, own, and operate it yourself. And cloud, you know, even though OMB A130 only has the word cloud three times, you know, cloud is constantly evolving. Um, really dramatically, the capabilities have increased just over the last couple of years. And so that clause inside A130 is really at the forefront when you think about cloud services versus trying to continue to sort of roll your own IT. So on that topic, what are your thoughts about uh, agencies uh, sharing best practices and lessons learned? Well, first of all, what we are seeing uh, across the engagements that we are, uh, that we, that we learn lessons from um, is that the agencies that are ahead are actually ahead in about four axes, okay? Their agile practices, their DevOps and automation practices, cloud management and delivery, uh, and cloud governance and security. That these four axes is where they have gone, uh, or they have taken st significant steps to increase their capabilities. So that's where the, the axes of maturity is for the, for the various agencies who are slightly ahead. Should they share uh, Yes, but I am a little hesitant to say that. I, I say that um, because it, that is a good goal, uh, and you can definitely leverage lessons learned at other agencies. <clears throat> However, agency missions are very typical. Their organization is very typical. The way they deliver IT is very typical. Uh, lots of things are very different. Um, point solutions don't really carry over. Um, good ideas will always carry over, but uh, not point solutions, okay? So um, it has to be thought through if there's going to be a formal exchange mechanism to be set up, how does this operate, what is the level at which it operates, and what is the kind of stuff that we do share? Um, so I think there will be some need for, uh, for that. Agencies that are ahead are also ahead in acquisition practices. They have learned their lessons of how is it, what are the intricacies of operating in the cloud that has bearing on cost and how they acquire resources. It is not just about acquiring resources also. It is also they are ahead in terms of how they deliver to the end users, to your mission. So you, we got this great package now, great new package. We acquired it and and how do we deliver it to our end users and mission? So looking at that, uh, those mechanisms also, certain organizations have made progress. Um, there's, I have in my, in my mind uh, a sort of a evolutionary path that I, I personally have seen uh, agencies go through uh, in terms of delivering there to the, to the user. And um, 
because if you if we don't make it easy for a mission to to consume these resources that we are acquiring your adoption rates are going to suffer people will do their own thing they have to deliver on the mission they will uh, they will do their own thing one offs will start coming up whatever we have to do to deliver on the mission will happen <coughs> uh, credit card purchases get done uh, lots of other things happen uh, but as we make it easier we impl and we impose the governance and the security policies that the, the old enterprise would require um, and how we deliver that without being a barrier to agility that the, that system owners would like to see in their teams um, that is the maturity that uh, and good ideas will always transfer I have witnessed uh, and listened to some ex-public servants um, who are doing exactly that um, that exchange happens at the highest levels as well as to the operational levels so it is happening uh, if I'm not quite sure if the question was to set up a formal mechanism to do it um, I haven't thought about that whether there's a formal mechanism but informally it is happening right I'm just going to uh, uh, pause over here real quick and see if uh, anyone in the audience has uh, questions at this stage Yeah, uh, this is the question for the panel. Uh, security is a shared responsibility, more so with the evolution of the cloud or the proliferation of cloud within the federal government. Now, one of the challenges that uh, we have is as we try to bring the solutions quicker to the user communities, we are faced with a shared responsibility of uh, securing information assets. Uh, in a cloud platform, uh, where you have different service providers providing different capabilities, for example, infrastructure as a service, a platform as a service, a software as a service, and then, then you have the user communities. Uh, do you have any suggestions for that can be leveraged to uh, help the system owners and the administrators uh, move faster to get a authorization to operate? So there were t two questions rolled up in there. I, I think one is security strategy, which we've addressed a little bit. I, I think it would be a mistake if you move to the cloud to just say, look, I'm going to keep all my old security stuff and just try to lift and shift my security over to the cloud. You are not gaining the scale and the efficiencies and the effectiveness of, of sort of capital expenditures and, and technical capabilities of the cloud providers. In, in terms of ATOs, uh, that's a separate question. Again, FedRAMP and the provisional ATOs were meant to speed the issuance of ATOs by the agencies and departments themselves, and the overall push has been an attempt to sort of increase ATO reciprocity. Oh, they have an ATO, I'll just sort of borrow theirs because they're using the same cloud provider or the same service, and I'll accelerate. When I was still in, in government, and I left in January 2017, um, we still hadn't reached that ideal state. You still had a lot of CIOs saying, yeah, I know what's going on with FedRAMP, but you know, I'm gonna redo some of the evaluations on my own just so I can sort of convince myself and trust it. Similarly, we've had meetings uh, with some uh, component CIOs at, at certain departments where there is a tension between the CIO and some of the traditional, their IT staff, which is at some point you just have to trust that they're fed ramped and not try to ladle on top of it a bunch of additional security requirements because that's the way you're used to doing it or because that makes you comfortable or because that gives you a level of visibility that you think you need. Um, so this, more than anything, is a culture change than a security issue. Um, I, I do think, though, it is important for anyone in the audience here to increasingly understand the capabilities that the CSPs provide and to build that into your strategies. Google, for example, on both its productivity suite and its sort of infrastructure platform and platform as a service, GCP, Google Cloud Platform, there are really robust dashboards and visualizations that show you who accessed your data when, that give you rheostatic control over who can access data and when. 
Again, there are security capabilities built into the, our cloud fabric from end to end. Hardware root of trust, zero trust network, not a perimeter model. Basically, I, I, I authenticate the user, I authenticate the machine, and I authenticate the purpose every time they're accessing a piece of data. End to end native encryption. Options on key management. Do we manage the keys or do you? Um, and again, these visualization dashboards to give you status at any moment. Who's pinging my data? Where is the inbound IP? What's the outbound IP? Um, and then encryption. Again, in many of these cases, and even according to sort of a lot of state laws and NIST standards, if your stuff is fully encrypted, when you lose it, you do not have a breach. So really, if you can focus on that and not spend all your time on what people call hygiene, I have to do the patch management myself. I need, you know, it really dramatically and strategically changes your security posture. Any other questions? Okay, I have a couple of interesting questions over here. Uh, so, I'd like to hear from all of you on the panel, okay, really quickly, what are some of the real life challenges of working in the cloud, right? Uh, are there any brick walls that you expect agencies to bump into at a certain point in their journey? And how can they prepare for that? Yeah, I think the two that I see most frequently are certainly culture and cost. Um, you know, there's, uh, Maria mentioned the need to turn the lights off when you're done or to, to shut down workloads. And so our, the traditional workloads that we have in our data center today are not really optimized for working in a cloud environment by and large, right? Just generally they're not uh, well suited. So I think you have to be intentional about how you whether it's a refactor or adapting that application to work in a cloud environment where you do have that horizontal scalability. Because if you're, you know, sort of the standard implementation in a data center has always been in plus one. How much do I need? Add one more. If one fails, then I'm, I'm good to continue operating. Uh, forklifting that model into a cloud provider is incredibly expensive and, and is really not the way that that's designed to work. So that I think that's really the intersection of cost and culture. We have this idea that we need more than we're going to use, and then by virtue we use more than we need. Um, and so it's it's really focusing on that application and and, and determining that uh, horizontal scalability. And then I think long term, as I mentioned, once you have a workload that you're able to scale horizontally and decouple from a very specific cloud implementation, you as the consumer get to have a lot of choice about where that workload lives. What, who is going to be your cloud provider today? If it's a nickel, a CPU minute, then go over there. But if you get it for four cents, let's have the ability to move our workloads. And so today, one last thing that I'll say, and I know we're running short on time, uh, is that when you flip on a light switch, you don't think about where that power is coming from, whether it's hydro or solar or even uh, coal or nuclear. And when you go and buy a television, you don't think about where that's coming from. But today, as an IT organization, when you go to build a piece of functionality, you're doing a lot of thinking about where that compute and how that compute is going to be surfaced to you. And so ideally, we get to a point where that's no longer a stumbling block. Dan, because do you have anything to add over there? We, I, I do want to get to one final question over here. Um, so. Just, again, cost and the huge culture change from one of CapEx and a long tail of O&M that eats up 75% of your IT budget. Cloud is a completely different cost model. And so to have it work inside the business, it requires close collaboration between IT professionals, CFO's office, acquisition professionals. I mean, this is a huge change in how you think about budgeting how you think about dollars, how you think about cost controls. And so it's important for acquisition officials to, to move to a period again where they're looking at risk to the enterprise, not so much risk of the IT project. Um, I think some of the other barriers, you know, you, re you look at the commercials, everything is like, everything goes to cloud. The reality is for a long time, you will end up being a hybrid multi-cloud enterprise. Not everything is going to shift to cloud. You will have stuff, some stuff on-prem, you'll have some stuff in the cloud, and to be honest, for resilience and performance issues, you will want multiple cloud vendors. Um, there is um, a maturity level, an awareness level that comes from managing a hybrid environment, right? So yes, there is, 
that is a new kind of expertise that needs to, develop, to be developed to manage a hybrid multi-cloud environment in a way that is optimal for you. I do think, however, net-net, it dramatically increases costs, certainly on the CapEx and O&M side, and it dramatically reduces risk to the enterprise. But that is a place where you need to invest. The other thing is that to take full advantage of the cloud environment, you often have to refactor da data and applications. Sometimes, again, you need to spend a penny to save a nickel. So that also raises questions and, you know, things like the new IT modernization fund are out there to try to help transition people across that transom. But those are some of the things I think yeah, that are important. Just, uh, continue on, final thoughts, we're out of time. So just, you know, uh, what is next in the cloud evolution cycle? What are some new technologies that we should be getting excited about? <clears throat> what does the future hold? Right, uh, so it's a truism that uh, by the time you are done setting up your enterprise cloud environments, uh, the state of the art, as far as the vendors are concerned, has already gone ahead. Uh, but what's next for cloud? What is cloud 2.0, 2.0 in government? <clears throat> um, generally, we see a certain state of the art across agencies, and and obviously the question, what next, is what next for you folks? Okay. Uh, in my mind, operationally speaking, uh, Cloud 2.0 in government is simply a self-aware, self-healing, autonomous environment with an eye towards manageability, security, and cost transparency. Um, it has certain features, self-service. Um, we would like our end users to just go up to a portal and acquire the services they need automated deployments, automated onboarding, ITSM integration. We want our IT service managed integrated into our cloud platforms. Um, serverless microservices, no ops, uh, cloud native uh, mission critical systems. Okay, serverless uh, management services, the cloud management services. Security as a service with active defense. We want to be proactive with our defense, not react to events that happen, security events that happen. Okay. Um, automated governance and policy enforcement. We would like that to be automated. Okay. And we want a full environment monitoring with a machine learning and AI based response to those events that happen in the other environment. So this is where you start putting in more intelligence into your environment itself, your operating environment itself. So these are some of the features that I see um, coming. These are some of the, te the technology. When we were dreaming about this uh, a few years back, the base technologies, it was a long shot because the base technologies did not exist. But every one of these things is in one form or the other is available in the market and it's a matter of crafting a solution to bring it to government. All right, 30 seconds, uh, Dan. 30 seconds to Adam. So I think uh, Vikas made a really good point, and that is that there really is no end state in technology, right? And so I think that as we enter into these acquisitions, we have to be very aware that change is on the horizon, change is coming very, very quickly. We need to think very differently about how the time frames uh, and the methods in which we're making these acquisitions. And the reality is, that success will not be defined by the technology acquisition that we make. It'll be defined by how well we prepare ourselves for that change that is imminent. Last comment. I, I think we have to move from the idea that the cloud is simply move my data center to somebody else owning it. That is not the promise of cloud. The promise of cloud, in my view, is further up the value chain, as Vika said. For example, analytics. It is true that inside government enterprises, there is an enormous amount of trapped data about programs, about customers, about enterprise performance that all, in my view, if unlocked properly using really inexpensive compute power analytics, machine learning, and AI, has the ability really, back to the transformation beginning, transform how government does its business. But you will not get there if you put a glass ceiling on yourself and say, well, all I'm doing is lifting and shifting my data center. No, the reality is to use these continually evolving capabilities to get much better insight into how to run your enterprise, run your department, run your agency, and better serve citizens. 
that to me is the promise of cloud. Doing that inexpensively without having to buy your own servers, buy your own licenses, manage your own environment. Let somebody else do all the blocking and tackling. You focus on your mission and you focus on doing your mission better. Excellent. Well, that concludes uh, our session. I would like to thank our esteemed panel. Uh, thank you all for coming and have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Hannah, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Very stunning. And as always, we can't say enough to about you, our audience, for bringing the time, the attention, and the enthusiasm that you have to these proceedings. It couldn't be done without you. And now, to deliver our closing remarks from the cloud, Mr. Jeff Kosas, Senior Procurement Executive with the U.S. General Services Administration. Good afternoon. Thank you to all of the planners and all of the panelists who helped to put today together, who took to the time to plan, prepare, rehearse, and deliver a really good set of sessions. Thank you to Melissa Gary and the GSA Ombudsman team. A special shout out to the folks at DHS for starting the reverse industry events. For GSA, reverse industry days are all about listening because we believe several good things come from these listening sessions. In our three previous reverse industry days, we heard, for example, how an option. Good afternoon. Thank you to all of the planners and all of the panelists who helped to put today together, who took to the time to plan, prepare, rehearse, and deliver a really good set of sessions. Thank you to Melissa Gary and the GSA Ombudsman team. A special shout out to the folks at DHS for starting the reverse industry events. For GSA, Reverse Industry Days are all about listening because we believe several good things come from these listening sessions. In our three previous Reverse Industry Days, we heard, for example, how an option that we had exercised way less than 1% of the time for our leases was viewed as high risk by capital markets. Thus, it drove the prices we paid significantly higher. We heard one large government contractor tell us that they had up to 13 levels of review to submit a solicitation proposal. We also heard how page limitations on proposals kept their bid and proposal costs down. In turn, that keeps our costs down. In another reverse industry day, we heard how poorly structured requests for information kept some companies from bidding on requirements, even when those requirements were directly in their wheelhouse. In response, GSA formed some tiger teams to address the things that we had learned. Today, we started this with a session on tips and traps. Next. We had a session that focused on giving you an industry point of view on structuring the solicitation. They told you some of the things that they've seen and that others wrestled with when it, what it really means to buy as a service. Next, we heard two different case studies related to cloud adoption. Finally, we heard about managing once you've moved to the cloud. Our hope in today's reverse industry event is that you heard a new view worth considering that you learned from the private sector how they dealt with an issue, which you might also encounter and find challenging. We hope you came away with thoughts on how you could better your move to the cloud. Perhaps you too will want to form a Tiger team to implement some of the things coming out of today's session. On behalf of GSA, thank you for attending.
And again, thank you all very much.